Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we haven't had a game of the in quite a while. We had um, a, few, a couple of endorsement meetings over the past few years, but none as large uh, as this. And of course, we haven't had an election like this in some point in the city of Boston. With Van Bruno resigning, uh, or retiring, excuse me, um, it opens up some council seats and affords us the opportunity to gather here tonight, hear from the candidates. Um, what are the priorities for our city um, and our neighborhoods and what their vision is in looking at us for the next several, several years. Um, I'm going to be quick with my introductions. Um, I'm Jason Lavillia, the chairman of the Ward 3 committee. Before I go around to the rest of the committee, um, I just want to explain some of the process tonight. Um, we're going to start with District 1 and then District 2 um, council uh, candidates. We're going to afford the, um, each candidate a three minute um, time frame for brief remarks um, and presentations, so to speak. They're free to um, distribute information to the committee and to, to the audience. I'll then open it up. You'll get a signal from Daniel or I that the time is coming to a close. We'll be presenting my remarks to my left. At that time, um, I'll open up for, for questions from the committee and in the audience, but I just ask you, um, because we have a full agenda to bear with me, um, I wouldn't want to cut you off, but I will. <laughs> um, and to keep the, uh, have a polite conversation, um, and please be able to ask questions, but um, because if someone's asking the same question, you would ask for the same subject matter. Maybe we could not ask those questions, so we're trying to keep each person up here for about 10 minutes because the amount of people we have and we want to be here all night. It's California. So, um, so, as I said, so I'm Jason Lee. I'm going to start over here with the rest of the executive board of the committee. Miriam Damato. Blake Weber. Daniel Tosco. You know, the water committee in this I'm signing with my former chair and my mentor. That's twice. That's a nice chair. Yeah, he said twice. That's why you got the good chair. <laughs> <laughs> the the brain's had to be comfortable. Holy Maria Pablo, Jackie Springfield, Rebecca Kaiser, Catherine Burton, Kevin Burton, Matthew Belanti, Jeremy Sazana, Jerry Moretti, Jim Gannon, Greg Gannon, Mark Heinovitz, Connor Finley, Sidney Asbury, Mike Dalton. So I ask that when you ask for those, that's the committee, I'll open up to them first. When uh, we call members of the audience at the time committing, you could just say your name and you're going to be in the street, but what name was in front of you? So the board three consists of anyone who wants to help down the south end, including Chinatown, Financial, Beacon Hill, West End, and one of them. Uh, in the leather district. So uh, with that, um, if anyone else has anything else, um, I'm going to open up for the district one council race. And uh, first, I just to make a note, um, we have two candidates, I believe, here. Um, the council incumbent is Salamatina, uh, Brian Gannon, is he here? And I know John Ribeiro is here, John Ribeiro Jr. So I have two people for speaking for the district one city council race. And representing the city council tonight, is uh, state representative Ms. Sal is on a family vacation in uh, Sensitive College um, when we sent out the invites that he already had the plan. So um, he asked if Dan could make his presentation when he's on behalf, and we granted that. So I'm going to introduce you first. Sure, thank you. Um, first, I, before I say anything, I'm going to be real brief, but I want to thank the committee uh, for putting this together tonight. We have a great turnout of candidates and a great turnout of uh, of uh, all three uh, uh, constituents. So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I am, uh, I'm here to speak for Sal and Martina. Uh, Sal, uh, to, to further along what, what Jason said, Sal's on a family vacation. His daughter is heading uh, to Australia to study abroad in a couple weeks. And so they wanted to take the time and, and spend some time uh, away 
from the chaos of the political realm uh, for a couple of weeks, or for a week or two, and so that's where he is, and so he sends his regrets and his apologies. Um, and I'm just going to give a quick story of why Sal is, is, to me, the best city councilor in, 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 uh, in Boston and someone I, I admire so greatly, um, with all due respect to the other ones that are in, in the room here. Uh, but, <laughs> who I like to know. Like like <laughs> but, but, you know, remember we, we, had, the, <laughs> we had the big snowstorm uh, back in February. Uh, which you know dumped a, a whole lot of snow on us and made it very difficult for us to get around the city uh, and especially in this neighborhood because you know we have small streets and they, they weren't being able to get plowed uh, initially um, that was on a Saturday Sunday morning I get a call at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, from Sal and he says uh, what are you doing I said oh I'm, I'm uh, about to have breakfast what's going on and he goes I'm coming in I'm coming in town right now I want to walk around the streets with you and figure out what streets need to be plowed immediately and he spent all Sunday, I think it was me, I think Steven was there, uh, who worked for him, and uh, a number of other people. Uh, we walked around the streets and we figured out what streets needed to be plowed right away. And that is the type of city councilor that Sal Martina is. Uh, and that is why, you know, I, uh, he's been loved so well in the North End over the last six years as a city councilor. You know, other things that I, I can point to that we work so well together on uh, is the Elliott School, Elliott School expansion. Uh, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, the, the land swap between North Bend Street School in the city to move the North Bend Street School to the city printing plant and have the Elliott School expanded into the North Bend Street School. That wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Sal Martinez advocacy, working with the mayor, and, and fighting for us. You know, and that was a couple years uh, in the making. It didn't just happen overnight, and it was something that he didn't quit on uh, when, when, we first had some, when we first had some difficulties at first. He kept, he kept at it, and he, uh, he fought for us. And that's what he's just been doing for us for the last six years, been fighting for us uh, like no one, no one else. And so from, from a Ward 3 perspective, from a North End perspective, uh, you know, it is an easy uh, vote in my eyes to vote for, uh, to, to re-elect Sal Martina and to vote for an endorsement for Sal Martina. So um, there's, a long, there's, a, there's a long list of things he could have, he's accomplished and he's done over the last couple years, but I don't want to take up any more time. You guys know his record. You can check it out anytime you want on the website. So thank you so much. This is also an endorsement meeting for the ward committee, so as well as the candidates, like, so the endorsement votes will be at the end of the, the evening presentation. It's not after each session. Oh, okay. the, after so just session. for the record, I'd just Thank like you. to say as a ward committee member whose name happens to be Gannon, I was hoping Brian Gannon was here this evening because as a ward committee member. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I say is I've gotten some calls wanting to know if Gannon is in fact related to me. Uh, my husband, and needless to say, he is not. There's no relation. And our entire Gannon family doesn't, does in fact support, you know, our, our council for all the right reasons that our representative had eloquently stated. And uh, so I just want to make that for the record. There's no relation. I did want to say hello to meet him. And uh, I just wanted to make that a matter of record. And of course, we we'll support him. Any other questions, comments, audience? So we're going to hear from Mr. John Ribeiro, who is um, from East Boston, who is running the district council as well. So I want to come right up and give the information. Leave it at the heads of the table. Good evening, folks. My name is John Ribeiro. This is my first time into politics. I've been functioning as a professional all my life, and I want to thank the committee for inviting me. I graduated Boston College in '66 after graduating East Boston High School and going to East Coast area. So I work as a mechanic going to school. I went back to Boston College in 72 for Masters in Urban Planning. But meanwhile, I started in 66 at uh, Shirley, being the staff psychologist, and I was one of the people that uh, actually transferred the residential programs in institutions into the 766 programs. And uh, I will give you a little update on uh, what I've done and so forth. But I just want to state my position. First of all, most recently I retired from East Boston District Court as a probation officer. I started the drug court there and mental health court there. 
the drug court dealt with people with addiction problems and children with addiction problems and families as well. And mental health dealt with people with mental health issues and got were, were arrested for mental health uh, kinds of uh, behaviors that could be easily be treated by, uh, uh, by treatment and mental health. And I still work in mental health with lots of mental health uh, board of directors for the past four years. Uh, so I feel that the public policy, the reason I'm coming into the, the political uh, arena now is I feel that public policy is the next level of intervention. I've worked in individuals and setting up communities and so forth. As a probation officer, I previously helped create the drug court, the mental health court, the East Boston court. And uh, I'm very concerned about reducing the level of violence in our streets with our children and our families and, and so forth. And uh, so I want to start a family court program. I started this from the federal government in Manchester, New Hampshire many years ago. This is a system where the family gets involved in early intervention. So the children don't get a record and later on they don't have a quarry so they can they kind of get a job to support their families. So by providing uh, education and treatment at an early base keeps families together and there's a lot of it's much more healing for the community. I go to uh, Woodlawn Cemetery and unfortunately I see like a lot of young people that are buried there that didn't make it to the system. Uh, but the education program, my plan is, I help with the Office for Children. I organized the first two councils for the Office for Children under Chapter 766 of the Dean At that time, I was on loan from my agency to the Office for Children, and we had discretionary money to start the special education programs. And in New Hampshire, I established a collaborative between the unions and the schools so that children, they're not children at 17 and 18, they can get out of school and get a job. At that time, they were running away through Boston and New York to get involved in drugs. They feel totally called the LA day. So, I want to give you this outline. And the economy and job growth. I want to work on a non-toxic economic plan that provides job opportunities for everyone and preserves the historical dignity of our neighborhoods. History is a commodity. And I think we ought to, we know what a commodity is because black people come to Boston because participate in that. I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. Uh, and I want to connect our neighborhoods together by means of water transportation. I want a non-toxic economic model that does not include a casino because gambling is not a fruit of our labor. It is the hope that the gain from someone else is lost. That loss may be our own. We will lose money, our savings, and our homes. Gambling will encourage crime and human trafficking. I helped stop the, the prostitution on Meridian Street by asking the judge to provide, to, to give the guys community service when they got picked up, and I had them do community service with the names in the paper and the pictures in the paper. That stopped the business. We're gonna have a lot of that if we have to see here in our midst. Mm -hmm. Also, be breaking entries because people want to see money to get in there and start uh, making some serious money. The other thing too, uh, the pollution that we have uh, right now with the airport, there's a very high incidence of respiratory diseases. Uh, this is uh, this is studied by Brigham Women's Hospital in winter, not then in East Boston. With the additional uh, fumes from the traffic, it's going to increase exponentially, not linearly. And also, our insurance is going to go higher because our insurance rate is based on the uh, on the accidents that occur in that area. I'm going to wrap it up right now. Okay. Okay, also, clean streets and trash pickup. You know, clean streets is something that's good for economic health and our physical health. It shouldn't be a favor from City Hall. We should have a system like Toronto and New York where things are picked up not because somebody makes a phone call and gets it done. It should be done automatically so that people can get up in the morning and just go out and you know, about their business and make some money and so forth. But I'm going to give you all a copy of this here and some of the things that I've done along the way. Thank you very much. Anyone from the water committee want to address the question? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, once again, Dan Foster, I appreciate you being here.
here. I didn't mention your former uh, probation officer. Yes. Retired in, in Over 40 years. Over 40 years. In, uh, criminal justice. And you worked with the East Boston District Court and the Drug Court in particular. And, and I agree with you in regards to educating our young folks about the dangers of drugs and alcohol and how to keep them free of drugs and alcohol. But as a, a PO, as you see, a lot of people that are on probation and have drug problems, uh, what I've seen in the court as a practicing attorney and doing a lot of criminal work is once a PO is in drug court and they relapse, and a lot of these folks have been in treatment, I mean, for substance abuse for many years and need long-term treatment, and you see probation officers really quick to uh, hit a violation down and move for sentencing, which in turn doesn't help the PO. How, as a city councilor, how are you going to work with maybe the court system and uh, maybe these, these adults getting them re-entry into the well, community? The, uh, the drug court is a special animal. The probation officers have to be trained because uh, addiction is a chronic disease just like diabetes and so forth. It takes a long time to get there and it takes a long time to get out of there. So that you have to keep on going you get, until they get it right. And you hope they don't die in between. But the thing is, you have to start early in the game. And I found that, I'll just tell you a quick story. I had this young man who uh, was in drug court. I found out that his parents were the ones that set him up on it. His father was the one that set him up on selling drugs and so forth. His mother was on uh, uh, regular you know, medication and so forth. He wanted to go to the East Coast State of Tech where I went to school. They told him, forget about it, kid. You can never get in here because you have a record. So I asked Judge Russo, who was actually from this neighborhood, listen, it's gone by the boards as far as, far as the revised and revoked, but he, he allowed me to do that. And this kid made it through, it took a year and a half to two years, and he's made it successfully. So the guilty got reverted to continue without a finding and dismissed. So that means he could go on with his life. You know, he could have a family and support his family and so forth. And the thing is, by what the family court that I'm proposing, it's something that's out of the offices of the city council, by the way. I did say Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, the family comes in for the evaluation so that it's not just a kid that gets tagged and learns how to be more violent. I ran the detention center in Rosendale during the busing and I brought my kids in there. I was a single parent, I brought my kids in there too. Uh, but by keeping them out and keeping them in treatment, we can save money, <coughs> the Commonwealth can save money, the parents can save money because it costs from forty to $60,000 a year to keep somebody in jail. And now we're, we're talking about being, having private prisons. You know, and they want to keep people there longer because they get paid by the head. So we're talking about early intervention. The city council can do that. Anyone else from the committee? Audience? Stephanie? Uh, Stephanie Hogan, North End Residence. Thank you. Uh, Boston Magazine in the June issue had a piece on the BRA, and they quoted Cairo Shen, the chief planner, saying that the BRA is a requirement to do a comprehensive plan being for the city. Instead, we work on specific plans in neighborhoods. Uh, members of the Residents Association and members of the uh, Beacon Hill Civic Association have requested in the past to see the, the neighborhood plan for their part of the city and have been told that that document actually was never written. Really? So this is this is something that I would like to hear all the candidates well, address. Let me address that. Your I, comment I, on the role I, of I actually have copies of the plans from 1982, 1990, where there was a comprehensive plan for each neighborhood. Now, my, my, my proposal for an economic model based on the history was based on some of those findings then because we have a lot of areas around that can be connected as part of the walking tours and bring people in to spend money. And uh, there was a comprehensive plan. And it's very interesting that East Boston, even though uh, Boston is known as the hub of the universe, does everybody know why? I'll tell you why. It's because of the shipping lanes, folk-like effects that emanate out of East Boston from by McKay and Hall and all these other people. So these ships would go all over the world, and Boston looked like uh, the hub of uh, the, the hub, and the and the Boston Bruins actually used their logo. There's the B with the spokes coming out that originated in East Boston. But in 1995, East Boston was completely omitted from any participation in the tall ships because it was being defined as a slum so they can give it to Massport. I was one of those people that fought for the expansion of Massport because these boss is down in the airport. And Mary Ann Pat, now Na the National Mar Maritime Hospital, I, I just want to let you know this. 
She's a young girl, age 18 years old, who grew up in East, was born in East Boston, grew up in the North End. She died at 23. I actually take flowers to a gravesite every once in a while. Our National Maritime Hospital in the Hudson is named after her. And I have her in tiles on the blue line at Maverick Station because I was part of the public art uh, committee uh, that included uh, the uh, Maverick and uh, the airport and so forth. So at the airport station, I have uh, Amelia Earhart, because who's a social worker in Boston, a very historical figure. And I believe that these figures are important, not only for history's sake, but also to give young people role models so they can go after and make the changes in their lives. So um, we need that. So if, I, if I'm elected, I will fight to get our neighborhoods tied and use history as a commodity. And also, you know, being clean and so forth so that uh, have a comprehensive plan. But they do have a comprehensive plan. I have two different ones from different parts. Uh, Jim, anyone else? Uh, yes. uh, Jason, you have a question. As a casino opponent, do you favor a citywide referendum on that issue? No, I, 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 I favor a local referendum because the impact will be local. As I said before, on Meridian Street, we had a whole bunch of prostitution going on. And these guys were giving girls drugs. Some of them would die. And the ones that would live would make money for them. So that this would have a direct impact on the area. And some parts of the city would not be impacted by the pollution, uh, by, the, uh, by the violence, and also by the, um, the overpopulation and the uh, taxing of our city services in the area. Because the pop overpopulation would come from the menial jobs will come. I think any important jobs will be going elsewhere. They don't have, the casino has no, cannot guarantee that they can hire people from East Boston. And once a casino is voted in, it becomes an authority. It becomes an unkillable pig because it exists for its own sake. I'm sorry, I used that word. I'm sorry. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to leave these here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And I want to bring that way of working to city council office. And I would ask for your support. Now, District 2, most of you might not be aware. So District 2 has three, what, three precincts? Um, three, eight, three, seven, and three, six, which is newly added to the district. So it's the downtown area, two, South End, and all of South Boston. I came here as, um, I came to this country when I was 11. It was the first time I ever met my father, and I have not seen my mother since I was six years old. And I used to really resent my mother for leaving me behind with my grandmother. It wasn't until I entered college and learned about American history that what had happened to my family was not unusual, that it was not their fault. It was law that was passed that prevent or ban Chinese women from coming to this country since 80, 1882. So we talk about generations of separation. So it wasn't until that law was changed in the 50s that family began to be unified. And I learned that how those laws get changed is because so many people come together to make sure that things that are not working need to be changed. And that it has such impact on families, and particularly children. So it was then that I really vowed to work in the way that involved everybody. So the people that we make decisions for, they need to be involved in that decision making. I want to bring that way of working to city council, and I ask for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you. I apologize for the short period of time. I know there's a lot of issues that are very important, um, but we only have to move over so much time, but I think we'll get some more answers during the question part of this process. So I know it happens to have a question. Anyone have no, a question? Just, yeah. Okay. Anyone on the committee? You must have a question. question. Uh, I wanted to assess it. Since well, I know development in Chinatown always has been, um, and now you have more of the downtown. What is, how do you view the balance between development and residential, commercial, or just even commercial? I've worked on three master plans for the Chinatown area one for each of the 10 years for the last um, 30 years. Planning can only be as good as we have ability to implement it. And I know that like Chinatown, the South End, everywhere, that this um, challenge of balance between residential and business is a huge one. I am for job development and economic development. And a lot of our community interest lies in small business being able to survive in the community. And we are under tremendous um, pressure with big developments that <coughs> the rents are just rising up too fast. That many of our small business disappear. You know, there used to be 10 grocery stores, small mom pop -up grocery stores within the Chinatown business area. There's one left. One that people cannot afford the rent and to be That is not a balance of what we we need people who, who are working here and living here should some way to be made in the community. And it is something that I think all of us need to come together to address. I was considering that. <laughs> Do you want me to answer that? that well, right now we don't because we, the BRA is unique in the way, in the whole country. There are no other city that have only one entity that have planning and development together. We need to have that separate. So, we need people who plan with a view of the whole city and not going from development to development. And we've been tracing that in Chinatown for 30, 40 years. Because you never understand how one development impact next one until you see the whole big picture. And we've been dealing with this for more than 30 years. And I know the same thing is happening in South Boston. Same thing is happening here. So we need that separation. I 
quick question. Um, in regards to schools, as a, a principal, uh, Joshua Quincy, as, as a father of two young children who go to uh, Elliott School here in the North Bend, um, years ago when, when I went to school, and maybe many of us went to school, it, it was a safe haven for us. And we didn't have to worry about uh, our children being harmed and our teachers. And what we've seen over the last couple of years is, is some horrific crimes. What have you done in the Joshua Quincy School? What we do at the City Council to make sure that parents like myself don't have to worry about our children's safety in our school and our teachers' safety. Is there any training that you provided to your teachers in case of an emergency such as that? What would the teachers do? I'm going to everybody recognize that the Josiah Quincy School is one of the top notch schools in Massachusetts, and I left the school for more than ten years to make it that way, that everybody, all adults, in the community, in the building, pull together and watch out for children. But, but at the same time, we cannot expect our school to be the answer for everything. We cannot. Teachers' focus should be on teaching and learning. So all the other social issues and emotional issues that we have in our school, the children bring, because of the question of society, that we need to have partnership with everybody else in the community so that the focus is on children, but it cannot be just this. I know that we have a good school and some of us good school. And it's the ability of the people who are in that school to be able to pull together and plan and implement the plan. But at the same time, a lot of people don't get school because they didn't feel it's safe to travel that distance to go through certain neighborhoods. So it's not just the school, but the whole neighborhood needs to be together. Right, and I agree with you. But the community makes it the school or the school the community. Whatever school I choose to send my children in, mm -hmm. I want to be able to walk my children to the front door and safe, yes. and nothing's going to happen to my Are children. Are you satisfied with the Elliott School? I'm, no, I'm not even satisfied with the Elliott School. So we can yeah. have that, right? Right. So yes. that was my question. So yes. So I'm just saying it's the adults in the building and in the community that needs to be together in one mind. When you look out for all the children, and you are always there for them. Thank you so much for your attention. So, in terms of my hour of speaking to the council on the building and the evidence of District 2, I told him to show up a little later. But I didn't have a good time, but he's on his way. I'm going to skip over and go into the at large races and build council to squeeze him in. Um, so, again, we're going to go by order of sign in. Um, we're going to go in by order of sign in, and um, we have in the at large race Phil Fryer Recently re-elected to the North End Waterfront Council, I'm lucky enough to be the vice president of that organization, where I served with uh, Maria and Stephen, or I just left. Um, I'm also the executive director of the Taste of the North End, which is an organization that was started uh, by my uncle Donato about 20 years ago. And over the course of the last 20 years, we've raised together um, my family and the community as a, as a whole about a million dollars for local uh, local charities. Uh -huh. The Mizarro Center, the Elliott School, St. John's School, uh, North End against Drugs and Impact, well, every neighborhood, um, North End Athletic Association, Association, every you know local charity has been touched by the Taste of North End. I'm very proud to um, to be affiliated with that. Um, I am. Um, my family came to this neighborhood in 1976. My father opened. Um, he bought Gorenzi's funeral home just down the street here. I don't know how many of you remember that. And turned it into a cheers um, in, in that restaurant still there, and we're very proud of our affiliation with that restaurant. I felt I kind of wanted to get out of the restaurant business. I grew up with my dad in the restaurant, so I wanted to get out of it. 
Um, I went to Boston College in, in, in Suffolk Law School, and I was lucky enough that my first experience in politics was working for, uh, for our great Speaker of the House, uh, Sal Mason. I worked with um, Jason and, and Daniel. I'm very proud of that experience that I had a lot in office. Uh, and, um, and, and, and especially in this room. Especially in this room, I'm very proud to say that I, uh, I consider Sal you know, a great teacher of mine. Um, a little bit about the reason that I'm running is because I, I opened my own business in 2009. And when I did that, I had to deal with you know, all kinds of city bureaucracy, about, about 15 different departments of the city. And I think um, as a young person, as somebody who, who had an idea who wanted to pursue a, a, a dream and, and, and create jobs in the neighborhood and, and kind of create you know, something cool in, in, in the part of the, the neighborhood that didn't have much attention, I, I just felt like there were so many obstacles put up in our, in our way. And I want to make it easier for, for young people, not just young people, but all, all people who want to create a job, uh, create, create a small business and pursue their dream. Um, as somebody you know, who um, who is part of you know an immigrant family, and when my father came to this country, um, it's only five years before we opened the restaurant. I don't think those opportunities exist anymore for somebody to kind of like you know start a small business and, and, and scrap together and, and turn it into something greater. So I want to make it easier for those kind of people. Um, as Jason has reminded me about every day for the last two weeks, I'm not eligible to become um, to get your endorsement. Because I'm a, uh, an independent. My mom was a Democrat, my dad was a Republican, so I'm an independent to try to keep the peace. Um, but, I mean, I'd love your endorsement. I don't know if I, um, I don't want to create a parliamentary problem for Jason, but, um, but more importantly, I'd love your vote um, on September 24th. I, I love this neighborhood, and that's the reason I'm running. I mean, we, we have a lot of issues in this neighborhood, but not, nothing as serious as what we've seen the last week with the, um, the you know, armed robberies and the, the carjackings and all that stuff. And that's really important to me because I just got married, and I want to stay here with my family. I want this to be a great neighborhood for my kids. So, um, I mean, we, we have, like, all these politicians who come here for fundraisers and then leave and turn around and, you know, raise property taxes, and they send, you know, an army of... Of ticket, um, of, of parking ticket takers, but we only have one cop that, that walks the streets in the North End. So I want to do something about that. I want to make sure that we're getting the resources that we need to have a safe community that, that everybody, you know, can walk the streets and not have to worry about, you know, being costed or having their car taken from under them. So, like I said, I mean, I, I hope to have your vote in September, and I'd love for your endorsement. But uh, I think Jason's going to yell at you again and tell you that they can't do that. Um, any, any questions? <laughs> Any members of the committee? Well, I, I'm going to reiterate. I know the audience. I'll open up to other audience, but I think we're going to go back to your question. Any members of the audience? How's your time? Nice independent voice, you know. Okay. Uh, but let, let me address because it's a important question. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, um, since you're on the council, what do you think are some of the most challenging issues you've dealt with while you've been on the council? Sorry, Mary O'Neill and Lil Charge. Um, I, I definitely think it's an issue of um, kind of the direction we see our neighborhood going in in terms of like, you know, we already have a hundred and something restaurants and, and every time like a store goes out of business, it turns into a restaurant. I think we've got to do something about that. I think, you know, um, it's important to have retail, like Suzanne was saying, you know, we need grocery stores, we need like, you know, local vendors who, who sell things other than food. So I, I think, you know, there's ways to, to keep it. Tenant, uh, landlords engaged, and I think you know that's, that's something that I would um, try to do. Make sure that we're not just finding you know licenses to give to somebody to stick you know a chimney outside of a building that was never designed for that, 100 years old anyway. You know, we've seen a couple of restaurants that popped up and, um, and, and fires in their exhaust systems because they were kind of retrofitted. So I think that's a big problem. Um, there, there are people on the council who kind of want to um, lift the cap altogether, get rid of the cap on liquor licenses in the city, and I think that's a, a a step towards a good goal, but I, I don't know if I want to get rid of all. Um, don't tie it anymore to, to the population. Because if we, if, if every neighborhood is like the North End and, and, and all these spaces turn into restaurants, I don't think that's good for anybody. I think we need to kind of protect the small business people who aren't restaurant owners. And, and not only that, we need to protect the restaurant owners. If somebody has like a good idea and wants to open a re restaurant in Roxbury and they have to face, you know, competition from every store on that street, they're not, they're not going to have a good shot at making it. So I think, um, I think that's kind of like. It's, it's, a, it's a great council, and um, I have very opinionated council. I really respect I really love being on it. You love the city council. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, BRA question, you know, I, uh, I just got married about four months ago, and my wife and I went to New Zealand for our honeymoon. And you, and 
there, while we were there, that we went to like the seaport area, like their waterfront area, and it was amazing. And it really made me think of like this, our seaport is, is kind of viewed as like the, the crowning achievement of the BRA, but there's no pedestrian really access to it. I mean, you can't really walk around there. All the restaurants are huge multinational corporations that like were lucky enough to get licenses from whatever connection they had. There's no like local restaurants. So after seeing like Auckland and seeing that, that awesome vibrant waterfront with like local businesses, I really think that we need to like separate the way that we plan for, for you know the city and then you know develop it. Because we need some better planning, not only you know in development but also in the school system. And it, I, I'm so happy that we got another elementary school in Israel, but I don't know what kind of game that followed. You know, we just fought to get the uh, Elliott School expanded. All of a sudden, we're going to get another one downtown. I mean, in the neighborhood, when there's nothing downtown and nothing, you know, down the line for these kids when they go to middle school and high school. So I think uh, I think we need better planning. I think um, part of that is separating the, 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 the authorities of the BRA. And also, I, about the BRA, like, a friend of mine just bought a condo in the Navy Yard, and he had to pay 2% of what he, what he paid for to the BRA. There's just so many like inane little things about the BRA. I think we have to make it much more like a regular government agency. I think we need to have you know clarity in the way they spend their money and also in the way they make their money. So I think you know more transparency in government is a great thing. And I think um, it should start with the BRA. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Murphy, the incumbent city council at large can and also the city council president. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I, I want to uh, thank the Democratic Ward Committee for having this event. I serve on the Ward 18 Democratic Committee. I've been an active member there since 1982, so not too uh, right out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of an thank you. Someone believe me. But um, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to uh, talk to you about who I am, what I've done, and why I wish to continue. Uh, uh, Steve Murphy, for the past 17 plus years, I've been an at large <laughs> member of the Boston City Council. For the past three plus, I've been the president, the leader of the City Council. And the City Council is like the poor, the poor stepchild of city government, it takes 14 people. We have a good mayor. Um, he's done a great job leading this city through a tough economy. He had a down economy. He had an up economy. He'd much rather have an up economy. We all would. We all know in every family that we're impacted by a down economy. Well, states are impacted by them, and cities too. And uh, Boston, uh, a few years ago, used to get. Uh, 33 percent of its revenue from local aid that is now dipped to 15 percent because it all flows downhill and Beacon Hill is making tough choices and as they're trimming their budgets they're cutting back on local aid so it's really been uh, nothing short of miraculous what the city elected officials have done um, in maintaining city services in the down economy with um, about a, a decrease of $240 million over the last 10 years. Just this past year, we had a net decrease in local aid of $18.8 million to the city. And we were able to continue same staffing for police, fire, same school staffing, and those are your big departments. Everything basically continuing as we continue to try to work miracles with finances. My um, uh, background in education. I went to Boston Latin School in the mid-70s. Uh, Stonehill College, I majored in finance and business. I was in the private sector for about eight years after that, running a major transportation company with over 400 employees at one juncture. And um, I left that company when it was sold to an out-of-state firm and went to work in the state senate and began to learn about the public side of budgets and how public side is a lot different from the private sector in financing and managing. And for um, the past several years, I've been on the city council. And uh, one of the things that you do know is that the city council cannot originate a budget. Unlike Aaron and the legislature, they, they, they can originate their own budget. They, they get the governor's budget, and then they originate 
a house budget, then the Senate originates a budget. City Council doesn't have that authority. We get the mayor's budget, we can cut it, we can reject it, or we can pass it. And um, we've worked to improve his budget, the mayor's budget, over the last several budget cycles, just working with our, our colleagues. Um, right now, currently, I have one at large colleague, Ayanna Presley. I have served with Michael Flaherty uh, before, and Garrett Saunders, who just came in, was a, a city councilor with me back in the 1990s. But um, for the city council, um, it's a difficult position to be in. When you hear from candidates about what they're going to change or what they're going to add, they can only do that if they're cutting something else. The bottom line is what we're working with, and we're trying to meet the needs of the people of the neighborhoods of Boston as best we can. Some of the things we've done recently, there was a, and we must be doing something right because there was a 30,000 increase in population in the city of Boston over the last 10 years, the new census. I might get my nudge. One minute. One minute. I get the nudge. 30,000 uh, 30, increase in population, and the city moved to uh, to site a school right here at 585 Commercial Street, as uh, the downtown neighborhoods is where all the growth are right now. So, uh, we've also had uh, a number of other important uh, issues that have, have come and gone our way. Past. My uh, contributions uh, have been with the reform of pilot payment in lieu of taxes. I uh, recently got a pilot task force, got appointed to it by the mayor, called attention to the fact that we didn't have a, we had a disjointed pilot system where people were paying what they wanted to pay. We put it on one formula and increased revenue over a five year period to the city by $32 million. That is an accomplishment that I can singularly point to as someone who called attention to that and brought it uh, before the council and into action. I also, um, a couple of years ago, we were talking about closing libraries of all things because we had a local aid cut. And um, I was in a conversation in the mayor's office with the mayor and I said, why don't we refinance some of the convention center bonds that we use to build the convention center to clear the land. And um, we had a discussion with his finance people and two weeks later, a council order came to us to refinance convention center bonds, saving us $18 million in interest. And we had a $14 million um, shortfall in the library budget. So we just plugged the hole there. So those are some of the things I think, you've got a generational change going on. You're gonna have a new mayor, you're gonna have um, at least five new members of the city council. I believe you can, there's room for a, a, steady, a steady hand, a guiding force on that body moving forward because our, our health, uh, our economic health is still precarious for all of us. So, thank you. Quick question. Quick question, since I know you're a financial expert and you're going to on the council, but you know, there have been talk in the past about, you know, we get so many of the uh, great academic institutions in the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know they pay a stipend to the city, but we're, we're, we're in such such economic stripes. Has there been any thought or consideration in actually, actually taxing? Well, you'd have to go to Beacon Hill and to the federal government to change the tax code. You'd have a pretty big fight on your hands there. Yeah. That's why we work with a voluntary pilot payment uh, plan to reform that with the aid and the, um, the uh, cooperation of all of those institutions. And um, a lot their of the property is all tax exempt. It's tax exempt, but they're, they're, um, Northeastern University was paying $30,000 for all of the property that they own across the city. And they're now going to be paying $2.2 million on this. So it's much more fairer to the other uh, uh, private nonprofits mm -hmm. and also to every property taxpayer. And about 85% of our revenue right now comes from property taxes in the city. Thank you. Councilor, uh, I know I have a lot of questions tonight. However, um, it, you, you know, you've proven to be a valuable asset to uh, the city council, to the, the city of Boston in particular. I've worked with you over many years. Uh, so I have the utmost confidence in you moving forward. And, and uh, uh, my concern is, is parking in the neighborhood, in particular with the North End. And I know the North End uh, Neighborhood Council and the North End Residents Association 
work some diligence in trying to work with transportation department, try to increase the amount of residents bought. I know it's tough. Yeah. Is, is there a plan? Is there something we can do to work with transportation to be a little more maybe responsive to, to our associations to uh, to look at, go through the streets and see if we can find spots? Yeah, there's nothing I know that you, you aren't already doing because we're, we've kind of grown up on a, on a, on a peninsula that was built in the 1700s. We're not a, a well laid out city by any modern uh, stretch. But one of the things I would suggest is that if any new development comes on, that they have to have at least enough parking spaces for the number of units that they're selling. Um, and in some cases, one and a half spaces, because there's going to be two people with cars in some of them. That's just the, the reality of uh, where we're at today. Maybe I should be beginning. Yeah. I don't think Councilman Murphy was here. Oh, I, I was there, right? Oh. Okay. That was the, the BRA question? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd like to see a, a separate planning agency, but this has been coming up for the last 10 election cycles, and the problem with the BRA is that it was created by state law, and no ordinance can, can change it. You have to go to the state legislature to change the makeup of the BRA. You have to do that with a home rule petition. And the only way a home rule petition can go is with the signature of the mayor. You can't have the city council pass it 13 to nothing, have the mayor not sign it. They don't even take it up up on Beacon Hill. So that question is, is more one of, you know, could you get the, the, the 12 or 13 people running for mayor to all say that they'd sign something to reform the BRA? If they would, sure. I'll. I'll uh, I don't think planning and development should be in the same agency. I've seen too many instances where they're looking the other way uh, in my lifetime. But it's not something the city council controls. We, the BRA was created by state law, and state law is being changed. Is the only way to amend it. I have a question. Uh, you're saying that the. But the individual councils have no say in terms of how BRA plays for their own neighborhoods? Oh, no, 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 I didn't say that. Oh, okay. Each individual councilor can go and work with the BRA over development in their own neighborhood. But the BRA, um, but the BRA the, uh, budget doesn't come out of the city council. They're self-funding. Their um, legislation, their enabling legislation came through the state house. So in order to change it, it has to go through the same process. City Council for over six years now. I've run in uh, four elections. I've gotten re-elected uh, re in each of three of, of the four. And um, I also have nearly 25 years of um, service with the City of Boston. I first came to the City of Boston uh, under the Flynn administration. And I've worked with him in the City's Parks and Recreation Department. And um, I, I uh, used to work very closely with um, Stretch Walsh, who used to be very active here in the Natalro Center way back when in the, in, in the North End. I also, um, then uh, after uh, 12 or, or 13 years with the Parks Department, I became a special assistant to the Chief Operating Officer. And there I, uh, I, I worked for Dennis DiMazio, who, who led the city's operations, all the, all the departments across the board. And, uh, and I was a special assistant, and I worked on matters to try and bring departments together to make them more efficient and more effective. And also, I, because I have a political science background and I've run for office before, I also was uh, involved in very politically sensitive issues. Uh, since getting elected in 2007, uh, I've uh, served on the council as the chairman of economic development. 
and I've dealt directly with the BRA and um, EDIC and the Department of Neighborhood Development as they come in front of the council on a regular basis. I've been reappointed to that position by uh, Councilor Feeney, who was president, Councilor Ross as president, and uh, th three times with uh, Councilor Murphy. And um, because uh, District 2 is the most active development district in the city of Boston. And now it has another precinct. It only had two precincts in Ward 3. Now it has another, which is Precinct 6, which comes all the way over to um, Causeway Street, but not into the north end. It includes City Hall. So that only adds to even more development that will go on in, um, in this city. I've, uh, I felt that as the Chairman of Economic Development that I've, I've done a good job in trying to balance between the growth that the city needs and what the neighborhood wants. And I, I, I have more of the emerging neighborhoods in my district, Four Point, South Boston Waterfront, Albany Street Corridor, and uh, the downtown crossing area where residents live now and didn't live before. So I, I have the experiences necessary to, to do this job. And uh, I love doing this job after having nearly tw now 25 years of experience. I find that it's an asset, and my relations that I've built over the time are an asset for anybody who's in my district. I also say often that if there was a crisis, we'd all pitch in. But progress and prosperity are always much more difficult to deal with because people are arguing about what piece of it they get or that they're not getting enough of it. And so I, I felt that I've been in a position to build consensus, often sometimes to, to my own demise, because you, 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 you're not pleasing one group or the other, but often for the betterment of the city and for the betterment of the district and what I felt was the betterment of the neighborhood. Um, one of the other responsibilities that I had on the Boston City Council, and this only comes around once every 10 years, is I was the chairman of, uh, of the redistrict. And in that process, it's the most, I've been involved in politics since I've been 14, I'm 62. A lot of things I've seen and I've been involved in. It was the most political process that I've ever been engaged in and I was responsible for it. And uh, I felt that the city has balanced its population in the districts and that uh, although it was extremely contentious, the city's in a better place. The districts are sound and, the, represent, and the, the neighborhoods are all represented. I look forward to the opportunity after uh, representing uh, uh, Precinct 7 and 8 in Ward 3 to uh, represent uh, Precinct 6. I really feel that I have the skills necessary to represent all of, all of those people and all of you that are, that are from those precincts. So, uh, if, uh, I can take questions? Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up. Council President Murphy stated um, um, the BRA is the Boston Redevelopment Authority. So their primary purpose is to redevelop the city. That's what it was uh, formed for back in the, I think it was late 50s or early 60s. And, uh, and, and that's what drives that, that engine. Uh, they have to do planning because it'd be absolute chaos if they didn't. But it's not their primary role. And we, the citizens, and we, the electeds, 
have to force them often to spend that extra time, spend that money to plan. Taking the South Boston waterfront right now, the place is on fire. Uh, the I just came from a meeting, that's what, and I apologize for being late, uh, from the expansion of the convention center. And that place is only two-thirds built. And they're looking for another, you know, 10,000 hotel rooms. All of that to occur down there. But we're going to use the same streets, same bridges, same buses, and then the residents. Um, the re in redistricting, my district had 75,000 people in. And District 3 in Dorchester only had 60,000 people. There's, an, there's a, a real inequity there, and, it, and, and therefore on delivery of services, on representation in government. So we do need to plan better as a city. Uh, I can remember when the BRA board in the Menino administration actually designated Rebecca... Anybody remember her last name? I'm sorry. But she was the city planner. That was her title. Bonds. Bonds. Thank you. And she was the city planner. And uh, it was heralded that the BRA was going to take on this responsibility. But as the year went on and the years went on, she moved further away from where the decisions were being made. So we do need to review that. And we, we need to find a way to have comprehensive planning and not just move to the economic ball, because that's what we do. If they say condos, condos are hot, banks are financing, boom, we move. If they say, no, no condos now, it's rentals, we'll finance rentals, whoop, up go the rentals. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Rebecca, I live in the South End, and I heard tonight your mayor introduced the Rebecca Hall Project, which is the South End, and not South East, but many city council are down there, and they're not present, and they're afraid, and they'll be nothing to do with the Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm not I'm from South Boston originally. I marched in the parade for, since I think the earliest I marched when I was 10 years old. It's a, uh, it's a South Boston tradition around uh, the heritage of being Irish and also the celebration of Evacuation Day. I've also uh, marched in the Gay Pride Parade. Uh, three out of the six times I was elected and participated in, in Gay Pride uh, Week um, activities. Uh, I will continue to march in, in both parades. And um, that particular, the organization that runs the St. Patrick's Day Parade is a veterans organization who has the sole right to that parade. Now, I've had discussions with them and I'll continue to have discussions with them about um, trying to get a more open and inclusive parade. But it's their decision, it's not my decision. So um, I'll continue to do that and, and hopefully that um, uh, as they get younger and a little bit um, um, more just, I, I get just open, then therefore um, they'll be more receptive to those sorts of activities. But I do plan on watching in both parades in the future. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Stephen Chan, live in Ward 3, Precinct 7, um, in South Bend. Uh, I have the extreme privilege of not only living in the South, but being very involved in the Chinatown community and as I'm sure you're well familiar. Um, you know, Chinatown has really changed over the decades. It used to be 80, 90 percent Chinese, now it's 50 percent, driven really by all the development, which I actually, in my opinion, is a good thing. You're going to see for it in the downtown area. It does cause a pinch on residents in that neighborhood. At the same time, the South End is really rising in costs. It's almost becoming an economic apartheid with um, subsidized housing on the one end. I'm on the board of the local industries there, yeah. and. Um, Increasing segment of, I would just call them laptops and latte segment, you know, on the other. And um, and so I look to, I'm curious um, what your vision might be for the area that actually sits between those neighborhoods, what's called the New York Streets area, where the Herald site is, and there's a new development going in there. I think our city's largest Whole Foods is going in there, so a harbinger of good or bad, I don't know. Um, and just wondering how you might actually see that zone, actually a physical, literal buffer zone between these two communities, um, actually being a place where the communities don't can mix, and that can actually do that bridge. So I'm just curious if you can talk a bit about that. It's actually a very a brief but very thorough answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it's, it's a very important development that's going on right now, and as you can see, it's in the paper on a regular basis um, with. Uh, 
Gray Bauer also uh, adding some 500 units, a proposed for 500 units in the area. I, I personally look at it as, fortunately for me, my family's from this area, and my, my grandfather was born in Bay Village and lived in Chinatown and on Sherman Avenue in the South End. That was all one neighborhood at one time. So before there was a depression of the, the pipe, those were all the same streets they went all the way across. And people walked back and forth and lived in it. So, and I can remember in the, in the 70s and 80s where a significant part of that was Chinatown. And so there's a balance that both the, the, the people who live in the, in the South End and the people that, uh, have, uh, in Chinatown who have a master plan who see that both as part of where they want their community to grow. And I think part of my job is to make sure that, that both do see that and that it enriches the, the quality of life for both the folks who live in, in the Chinatown community and those who live in the old Dover and H Beach neighborhood. <laughs> Anyone else? Right, thanks, Council. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. City Council for 10 years, five years council president, and also was a candidate for mayor in 2009, and now running uh, for one of the four at-large council seats, two which are open. Uh, this is an exciting time for our city, an exciting time for Ward 3, and, uh, and the fact that uh, for the first time in 20 years, uh, we'll have an opportunity to elect a new CEO. And with that, there are five new members, or at least five members of the council, actively now running a uh, for mayor that will obviously create an opportunity for some new blood, but at the same time, I think that uh, there's a huge opportunity and an exciting opportunity for this council to play a more important, if not equal, partner role uh, in city government with the new administration. And I can tell you that uh, the new administrator, whoever she or he will be, will obviously need a good, strong relationship with this council and will also need to lean on experienced members of this council, experience of which will bring to the table, uh, fighting for uh, neighborhood issues. That's the primary function of the legislative branch of city government is the delivery of basic city services. And someone that's going to fight to make sure that lifelong residents, people who call Boston their home, uh, want to stay. And that residents that uh, come to find Boston, fall in love with our city, uh, want to stay. Uh, it's providing good quality educational opportunities uh, in all of our neighborhoods. Uh, hopefully a great neighborhood school uh, will be uh, front and center for this community to keep young families from the North End uh, and surrounding communities in, in our city. Uh, it's the hope that uh, for the first time, I hope that we're going to get snow melters. Uh, so that both Aaron and Sal can actually stay in bed. <laughs> uh, it's about trash collection. It's recognizing that we as city councils need to find creative solutions with residents, particularly residents who live in densely populated communities with respect to trash pickup uh, and how we effectuate that throughout our city in a, uh, I guess, unfair and, and, uh, and, uh, and sincere way. Uh, it's about uh, rodent infestation, particularly for, for this community. Uh, oftentimes you look and you're the closest neighborhood uh, to save all the times you feel frustrated that some of those basic city services whether it's rodent control or again trash collection uh, police enforcement uh, making sure that those basic city services are services that uh, you folks know me uh, you know that i'll fight for those issues you know that i'll stand up uh, for your community but at the same time you'll know that i'll work with your local elected officials your state rep your state senator your district council as well as uh, our new mayor as we move forward so uh, with that um, i'm open for questions uh, i think folks know a lot of the things that I've supported in the past and have a sense as to what my voting record is, uh, but I'll defer to those that have any questions about my candidacy. would like the opportunity to ask the voting members of Ward 3 as a lifelong Democrat, someone that served in both Ward 6 and Ward 7 Democratic committees. Hopefully I've earned your, your trust and your confidence and your faith uh, that not only do I know how to do this job, but I know how to do it well. It would be uh, very grateful for the opportunity to return to City Hall on your behalf and would ask for your vote and endorsement uh, this evening and for members of the community to ask for your vote as well on September 24th and again uh, when you go to the polls in November. Again, this is an important election, first time for a new CEO in 20 years, but also this is an exciting time for our city, for the council, and this council is going to be playing a very active, if not equal part role, and I'd like to, uh, you know, my experience as a member that knows how to get things done uh, to work with all of you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
They have a great idea, they have great plans, but their plans never come to fruition because the economic development on you serves that. With a standalone planning department <coughs> and having a plan and then having the economic development on implement that plan, I think would go a long way in solving at least some <coughs> of the angst and frustration, quite frankly, from people that get invited to meetings. You can go to meetings to be blue in the face if the cake is already baked and the deal's already been cut. <coughs> the meeting's a sham and you can go to 10 of them and you think that you're making progress and you think that your voice is being heard only to find out that there was a completely different outcome of the vote vote that you may or may not have attended. So unfortunately that's been happening for a while. <coughs> but there's an opportunity for not just the candidates for mayor running to make that commitment and pledge, but also for the candidates uh, that are running for council to say that you know, they'll work within that system and having a standalone. And believe me, it'll make elected officials' job heck of a lot easier, particularly at zoning board of appeal day or zoning commission day or BRA board vote day, that uh, you have an opportunity to say, well, there's a plan here and the community worked on this plan. And that's an important plan. That's important to protect the quality of life for that particular neighborhood. Let's implement that plan. Let's not change the rules in the middle of the game. Let's not call an audible at the 11th hour. Or let's not have them switch their team and bring in the hired guns and folks that are kind of plugged in. Uh, and then all of a sudden you get extra height, you get less parking. So I, I understand your angst and, and I, I would support a stay one plan. Any other questions? I would also, but in fairness, I'd like to take on the, that same question. Is that I also will be marching and, and have marched in both parades. Uh, and the parade, the South Boston St. Patrick's Parade, has never defined me as a person or an elected official. In fact, I was the very first citywide elected official in Boston to endorse marriage equality. Long before the Goodrich decision, and long before other elected officials got comfortable with not just domestic partnership, but with civil unions. And so there's been a lot of firsts for me as your at-large counselor and as the council president. Um, I like to think that if I get invited somewhere, I go. <coughs> I know there's an expectation from family, friends, and neighbors that they see you there, whether it's the Columbus Day Parade that alternates between the North End and East Boston every year, or it's the Pride Parade that I've been a regular participant, again, before it was fashionable. It's actually, I think it's the best parade in the city, quite frankly. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. And I bring my kids. My kids go. They have a great time. Um, but uh, more and more, you're starting to see the parade. That parade gets bigger and bigger every year. And every year, you see more and more elected officials that, that weren't there two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So I'm proud of my record, particularly, uh, with respect to uh, the GBLT community, and always have been. And at the same time, I just thought of fairness, given that I hail from the same community that uh, folks should know where I stand. So, thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Conroy. And I'm just going to tell the candidates you're going to start watching my ruler because I'm going to wait. So when you see it waving, that means you're going to finish up. Okay. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Uh, my name is Chris Conroy. I'm running for City Council at Live. I am a teacher. I'm a community organizer and I'm an activist. And I'm uh, originally from Dorchester, now a resident of Roxbury. Um, more importantly, more than anything else, I'm the son of two educators. And I strongly believe in an aspect of my education that I came up, I came up from, through the Catholic school system, um, in that the greatest among you shall be your servant. And I. I'm absolutely committed to be a servant leader um, on the Boston City Council. And there's really one main drive for that, uh, for that cause. Um, there's a lot of different names for it in our city. We call it the achievement gap, health disparities, the digital divide. Uh, you can talk about high crime areas. But it's a pure and simple lack of opportunity for a vast majority of our city. And that's why I'm in this race. And that's why I'm running. Because I want to make sure that every single resident, every single person, every single family has an opportunity to go and achieve the things that they want to achieve in their lives in this city every single day. I'm an educator by trade. And so, a large part of what I want to focus on is this, our school system. I believe that we have the ability to extend our school day, 
by bringing more resources in to our schools. And I don't think we have to stress our budget more than we already have. We've increased funding uh, for education this year. We've made some strategic investments, and the council and the mayor should be applauded for that at this time in our city. I think we need to go a step further if we really want to see us close the achievement gap as a city and to provide great education to every single neighborhood and to every single school, similar to what Ms. Lee has done. We need to bring employers to the table. We need to bring our colleges and universities to the table. We need to bring the financial institutions that are some of the largest and most effective institutions and job creators in the world into our school systems to make sure that our students and our families have the resources to succeed. I work in Citizen Schools, which is an after school program, and it's partnered with Boston Public Schools. 20% of the sixth graders in Boston Public Schools actually go through this particular program. And they've seen results in reading, in math, that pretty much take care of the differences that you would see in English and math scores in one year. And the reason for that is not because they've extended math and English time, but they've brought professionals from our communities into our schools to teach things like architecture, like computer science, like arts, and Richmond. We can extend our school day if we start to think about these resources coming in for all grades citywide, and we can do that. I've worked in workforce development for a number of years. I started off working at the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office and the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office in Brockton. And I've also recently just been um, with Yura, which is an organization that serves 18 and 24 year olds in the city of Boston. And it gives them a year of training to prepare them to enter fields in finance and IT. Over 65% of our operating budget in that organization comes from, not from state or federal funding or city funding, it comes from the employers. And the reason it comes from the employers is because there's an effective training program that engages young people where they're at in their community and brings them and partners them with employers that need and that have open seats for entry-level talent. There's over 20,000 young adults that are out of school, out of work, and out of the game. And pretty soon, they will not be able to open up houses, to buy houses, to strengthen our communities, and to bring wealth back into them if we don't do something about that. I'm committed to bringing employers to the table to say when you do have new economic development and when you do open new offices up in the seaport, in the North End, in Roxbury, wherever you may open it up, we want you to reserve 10% of those seats for young adults in our city so that they can come in and they can participate and get an entry level job and get the experience they need to have the 21st century jobs that our city requires to be healthy. And in the last part, I'll address the VRA question right away. If I'm elected, I'm going to work very closely with Representative Michael Witz and, and any other representative in the city of Boston to do, if we need to get a home loan petition to make sure that economic development does not usurp neighborhood development and planning at the neighborhood level, then we'll get that home loan petition. We're going to get it. And I won't stop until we do. So that's what I'm about. I'm about education and thinking about differently about how to get around the limitations of a budget. I'm about economic development and I'm about getting people back into workforce training that works and that brings employers to the table and brings our community colleges to the table. And I'm about empowering citizens to take control of the development in their communities and to make sure that they have a say in what's built in the communities. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, with your focus on education, can you talk a little bit about the new assignment policy yes. and how you think affecting that will affect the public school system? Absolutely. What was your name? Jennifer McKibber. Jennifer, thank you very much for that question. Uh, so I think the school assignment uh, policy is an improvement, and I do not think that is the final answer to the question. The final, the final answer to this question will be, do we have a high quality school in every single neighborhood so that we don't need an algorithm to determine whether the, a child has a high quality education? It is, we should be working towards a no wait list city. If a parent knows that there's a school that's going to work for their child, and they know that they have three options of schools that can potentially work for their child, they should be able to get into one of those options. 
my partner and I have two stepsons, 12 and 5. We've Catholic schools, private schools, public schools, Metco programs. The journey that, and this is primarily my partner, has had to make over that period of time to make sure that her, her boys or our boys are getting into the kind of educational opportunities that they need to succeed is incredible. We should have a single application to all our schools. Families should, in fact, if they live in a particular neighborhood where there's a charter school, they should be automatically enrolled into that lottery. And we should be making sure that we are concentrating and putting our resources into making sure that our traditional public schools have everything they need to be high quality. And we should be controlling the, gro the growth of our charter schools. I don't think we should put the cap entirely, but I think we should, we should, pro we should put a limit on a good thing, but we should control the growth of our charter schools and make sure our traditional public schools are protected in terms of their funding so that we can do just that. Anyone else have a question? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. As long as you're forming here, and we're coming up to uh, 7.30, we have the room. Um, and we're gonna, so we're going to keep the time limit enforced um, to watch again for my role of dance nudges. So Jeff Ross, come on up. Thank you for having me here. My name is Jeff Ross. Um, I am an active member of the Ward 9 committee. Um, I almost became a member of Ward 3, but I moved just right as you guys were having your elections, and I would have loved to have been part of it. But I appreciate all the work that you do because, as hardworking Democrats, I know the sacrifices that it takes to be here and spend this extra time, and then for all of the work you do out in the community. So thank you for that, and I want to thank Jason for organizing this. And, um, I'm Running for at large, I came to Boston 19 years ago uh, with a small bag of belongings and a pair of jeans. And I was the first in my family to graduate from college. My mom was a waitress, and my dad was a laborer, and they worked hard so that I could have a better life. And when I came to Boston, I found opportunity in the city, and I want to give back to the residents of the city of Boston because um, I've been able to have kids and raise them here and have a small business and make a life for myself. And I think that we need to keep the talent that comes to the city of Austin. So I, I want to work on a couple of things as a city councilor and raise awareness about a couple of things. And one of those is small businesses and um, access to capital. I think that if we put the, local, the city's money in local banks, that we can create access to capital for small businesses um, in the city and provide opportunities. Because uh, one area of the American economy that's the fastest, one of the fastest growing sectors of the American economy is women-owned small businesses. And that type of entrepreneurship is something that we have a lot of catching up to do here in Boston. Um, I also would like to see smart development in the city. Uh, one example of that is the purchase of Carnitas Hospital, which uh, was a nonprofit institution that didn't give money back to the city's tax rolls. And when that purchase happened, it became a private institution and it became a taxable entity. And that type of resource. Uh, coming back to the city helps us pay for the city services that we need. We have important choices to make over the course of the next 20 years. We have to figure out a way to pay for you know, the police, the firefighters, and the teachers. It's the 70% of the city's budget. And we've been able, through that type of um, approach to the city, continue to grow the tax levy at about 4 to 5% a year over the last 10 years. And if we do that, we're able to keep resident property taxes from being raised at the maximum capacity that they have. And that makes the city more affordable for city residents. So that's something I like to look at. Um, I also want to work on breaking down barriers between neighborhoods. I have organized um, groups around uh, equality in the city. Um, one of them is St. Patrick's Day Parade because I think that our city should become a more compassionate and a more inclusive city. And the more compassionate and inclusive we are, the safer our neighborhoods become, the more people want to come visit our city, stay in our city, and invest in our city. And if I get elected, I'll be the first to open the gay citywide city councilor ever in the city's history. And I'm here to ask for your vote on September 24th and November 25th. But more importantly, I'm here to ask for your vote in the Ward 3 endorsement process. And I really thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. This side has some questions. I want to go quickly to the ERA yeah. question. I, I live in a historical neighborhood too in South End. And I've talked to residents in Beacon Hill in the Back Bay 
And I think that we do need a master plan that is neighborhood driven, and I think that has to be a driven input process. We have to look, you know, some of the plans that people are talking about that have been around for a long time are outdated. Our city's changed, um, development has changed, the density of our neighborhoods has changed, and I think that some people in my neighborhood and this neighborhood have 15 minutes of light a day, and they need access to air quality and parking. So I think that that zoning piece of it should be a community-driven piece. And right now, we've got to work within the infrastructure of the VRA. So I think that it's got to be community-driven, and that that's got to be the driving force of it. And that it's got to be neighborhood by neighborhood, because each neighborhood has different needs. So that's where I would be on that. Any other questions? Right. Thank, Thank you. you. acknowledge the democracy in action not only in this room but in this field this is an incredibly talented at-large candidate field and I want to say that I'm especially encouraged by the number of women that are running um, so again my name is Ayanna Presley I have the honor of serving as one of your four at-large Boston City Councilors you have incredible district representation in Aaron and Sal but it's been my honor to represent you since 2009 re-elected in 2011 for those of you who have supported me in the past I say thank you for those of you who support I have yet to earn I hope to do so, and I'm here this evening to ask for your endorsement. Uh, when I joined the council in 2009, I formed a new standing policy committee, which I chair, called the Committee on Women and Healthy Communities. I really wanted to work on issues that people had not traditionally considered to be germane to municipal government, had not considered them to be relevant. And as an at-large counselor, I think it's my charge to work on issues that are neighborhood transcendent. Um, you know, my bio talks a lot about the fact that I worked for uh, Senator Kerry for 11 years and Congressman Joe Kennedy for four years, which is a great political tutelage in education. I think it has um, better equipped me to do what I do. But what qualifies me are my life experiences, being the only child of a single parent, um, growing up with a father who was addicted to drugs in and out of jail in our lives, being a survivor of a decade of childhood sexual abuse and sexual assault as an adult. Unfortunately, these are not issues that are rare or are even provocative. Um, the reality is that my life story is a normalized story for many people, and I wanted to bring that perspective to government and work on those issues. So I formed this committee, the Committee on Women in Healthy Communities. We can't be a strong city without healthy communities. Healthy communities have everything to do with the stabilization of our families, who have been destabilized because of unemployment, underemployment, mental health, addiction, violence. Um, that's the healthy communities part of the committee. So I want to stabilize our families, every family model, grandparents raising grandchildren, two mommies, two daddies, single parent and household, a family of one. I just want the city to work for every family. And the women part of that committee is to work on issues that uniquely impact women and girls. Um, issues such as teen pregnancy, human trafficking, domestic violence, sexual assault, fighting for more women in police and fire in the trades, and looking to eliminate barriers for women entrepreneurs. So that's the scope of the committee. In broad strokes, my work is about breaking cycles of poverty and violence. And how do you do that? We have to eliminate barriers to education and, and um, employment opportunities, and we have to build wealth. That's a three-pronged approach. This is why I've been fighting for a greater investment in adult basic education. The best gift you can give a child is a stable adult. And our homes are destabilized because many of our adults are not equipped for this workforce. And that need continues to grow. We're not meeting it. I fought for a greater investment in adult basic education and ESOL, and I will continue to do that. I've partnered with our Attorney General, Martha Copley, to go after our for-profit colleges and universities. If you're an insomniac like me and you see these commercials, they are preying on veterans. They are preying on single parent households, people living in poverty, and that number continues to grow, by the way who just want to get on a pathway to self-sufficiency. I've partnered with our Attorney General Martha Coakley to do a consumer awareness campaign so that people know the risk before they enroll in these schools. The other thing that I wanted to uh, speak to relative to my commitment to breaking cycles of violence is to talk out about sexual violence. When I saw that there was an increase in sexual assaults throughout the city, again, a neighborhood transcendent issue, pervasive and non-discriminating. 
As a survivor, I brought together 100 women from neighborhoods throughout this city, including the North End, the South End, um, every neighborhood represented by Ward 3, survivors of sexual violence who wanted to get on a pathway to healing and connected with services. Family members who had loved ones impacted by sexual violence and didn't know how to help them, we gave them the tools. And people who fortunately had never been victimized but wanted to feel empowered and do their part as a resident of the city community, they left feeling empowered and they did self-defense classes. The last issue that I want to talk about is the thirsty elephant, elephant in the room. Uh, it was referenced that there are city councilors in this room that are looking to lift the cap on liquor licenses. Um, I'm not going to run from this discussion. Um, I'm the one actually leading that charge and I wanted to speak very briefly um, to why I'm doing that. Again, my work is about breaking cycles of poverty and violence. I said the way we do that is to eliminate barriers to educational and employment opportunities. The third is to build wealth. And what I want is an equity and opportunity. The North End has 99 licenses. You don't want any more. But Mattapan has nine. And Roxbury has 26. And Dorchester, you are, what are you, 0.2 square miles? Dorchester is the biggest neighborhood in the city and has 93. That makes no sense. Now, what I did was listen and respond as I met with small business owners throughout the city. As an at-large counselor, that is my charge. They said the current law was antiquated, that the process was confusing, and cost prohibitive. And I worry about this because that means we're losing revenue, we're losing jobs to other municipalities. And I really wanted to focus on restaurants and making the process easier whereby they procure liquor licenses because I believe in the role that they play in transforming community. I believe in the role they play as community anchors and as economic drivers. The current law is hurting our neighborhoods and it's hurting businesses. And I want to be very clear, as the daughter of a recovering addict, I've dedicated my life to mitigating the impact of social ills. I'm not in any way trying to convert Main Street into New Orleans Bourbon Street. Not at all. But what I do want is an equity and enterprise opportunity so that every neighborhood can have the opportunity to thrive. And this would not circumvent a neighborhood process. In fact, it would give us more control. I want the control to be returned to municipalities so that we can decide with you how best to revitalize our neighborhoods, not the state, which is the current process. So thank you. I'm sorry I went over. And Yeah, okay. <laughs> Anyone on this side, I don't know if it's in the VRA question on the second. Any other questions? Just let me just touch on that quickly and sure. VRA, the separate planning and development. You know, so I'll, I'll add my voice to the chorus. I do believe that planning and development should be separated. We need a master plan of visioning. I think the best partnerships are those that are symbiotic, that are community driven, and government endorsed. And I think we need to have a real process, one that is not pro forma and an exercise. And I'll also offer something else that I've had great success in doing with the Boston Residents Jobs Policy, uh, which is an ordinance that I strengthened uh, through, an, through uh, an amendment uh, with uh, Councilor Michael Ross. And that is that I think that we need a community benefits agreement, we need a benchmark. So although I think neighborhoods should be special, uh, development should be customized and specialized and community should drive that process, I think that we need to have a standard community benefits agreement, and then within each neighborhood, we can build upon that. But I think that that is something that we have a greater opportunity for if there was a separate planning arm. Michelle Wu. I'm doing this as why I do most everything else in my life. I am the oldest of four kids, and my parents were immigrants to this country. I'm 28 now, and it still shocks me when I think back to when they came to the U.S. when they were 27 years old. So I can't imagine having to leave behind everything I know now, go to a foreign place where I don't speak the language, and really try to build a life for my future family. That's exactly what my parents did. They came here not speaking English, nothing in their pockets just so that we would have the chance at opportunity, education, democracy. So I learned from my parents how to work hard, watch them learn the English, and we worked hard at our studies. I started, um, as soon as I was able to work age 14, shelving books in the local library during the summers, worked in restaurants, uh, worked on my job just to contribute to the family. 
and I was lucky that I got into Harvard on a scholarship and later graduated from Harvard Law School also. In between, I opened a restaurant and really learned how to work hard then. Um, so I know the lifestyle of being in the front with customers all day, wiping down the tables, making sure the numbers add up, and then being in the back washing the dishes all night. So my family and I are here because of the resources and the opportunities that Boston has given us. Uh, I think it is incredibly important that we honor all of the opportunities we have in Boston, and really make sure that every single neighborhood has access to those. My political education comes from two great figures who really believe in the same thing. Mayor Menino, uh, for whom I worked when I worked in City Hall. I worked on restaurant permitting and food trucks and trying to simplify the process, creating a guide, getting more information out to residents so that local entrepreneurs could understand the process and bring their dreams to reality. And I also worked for Elizabeth Warren, who was my professor in law school. We worked very closely with the Ward 3 committee in making sure that she won Boston big. She is a strong believer in local engagement and really working hard for families to have fair opportunities and at that shot of the American dream that, had, that brought my family to this country and this city. So I am just here because I'm respectfully asking for your support in the, the elections on September 24th and November 5th, but also for this endorsement. I'm a former chair of the Ward 4 Democratic Committee, so I know that this is where a lot of the action happens. And Ward 3 is near and dear to my heart for many reasons. But I am a former North End resident, I used to live on Salem Street over by the church, and would actually get bread at the shadows every week, so I was heartbroken to see it closing down. We need to support our local businesses. My sister, uh, for whom I'm the legal guardian, graduated from the Elliott School in the North End, and I was the uh, parent chair of the school site council there. So learned up close uh, with, I think, the best principal in the entire district, Tracy Griffith. And we need to be expanding those best practices. So also very important to me, Chinatown, uh, of course, 3-7 in the South End. Um, so I will be an open door uh, anytime you need anything. I've been on that side knowing what it's like when families are struggling. By the time you call City Hall, you're, it's not the first phone call. So I'm going to be there to make sure that I'm responsive, accessible, and also in the neighborhoods all the time. So you don't have to come to City Hall. <coughs> Thank you so much. Any questions for Michelle? <laughs> Question. Um, the work in zoning and planning. Um, how would you, in, as we try to promote more local mom and pop stores here in the neighborhood, but the process of zoning change in, in uh, the city of Boston, and as I see it a lot here in the North End, it's very long. Very, it's a, at least a six month process before you get your, before you get your permitting. What do you plan on changing in terms of promoting our local small business and how to expedite the process so uh, mom and pop stores can open up without being six months back rent, you know, so they can get a heads up and I'm going to get to Doug, one of our plans examiners here too, but with a lot of questions on yeah. zoning. But what is your plan in terms of ex expediting the process for us small businesses? Yeah. I think that is one of the most important ways to revitalize neighborhoods, and I've been on that the other end of that, where I was that small business owner using all of my savings, taking the big risk, and watching rent go down the drain and waiting for inspections and permits to come through. So I think there are a couple things. One is we need to get information out there to people immediately. When I worked in City Hall, when I started in City Hall, none of the information was online. All of the permit applications were hard copy only. So in order to even start thinking about it, you had to take time off work, march down to 1010 Mass Ave or City Hall just to get started. So at least now we have a guide. I created a guide called the Restaurant Roadmap that lays all of it out from start to finish. There's numbers you can call. There's inspection criteria. In the long run, I believe we need to simplify the process, cut out some permits, collapse them together. Restaurant owners and entrepreneurs are being asked for the same information over and over again by several different departments. That should just all be streamlined on the city side. I also really think that we shouldn't be treating small, small business owners, the neighborhood entrepreneurs, the same way as we're treating the big bars and, and huge restaurants with 500 seats. There should be an expedited process where there's a, I don't know where exactly the cutoff should be, but say you're applying for an occupancy, occupancy permit for less than 30 seats or less than 40 seats, whatever we think is appropriate, you should be guaranteed a one-week turnaround or two-week turnaround by the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals, for your request so that you can get started in planning. There should also, I would love to see some sort of subsidy or extra expedited process as a reward for those starting a restaurant or a, a local business out of a vacant spot to also continue further generating that. Sure. So, yes, very close to the time to I actually believe that planning and economic development are very intimately tied, and that for us to just 
commit to separating the two wouldn't get at the problem. So I think that there's an important relationship between the two. I would love to see more weighted towards the planning side. For me, the issues with the BRA are transparency and accountability. And I would love to see that neighborhood associations be empowered, not just to say no at the very end, but from the very beginning, envision, proactively plan for what they would like to see, and then come, and then come back with economic development and see what's realistic and feasible in terms of our city and jobs. I'm a lawyer, and I know that when you go before a judge, the judge, when they, they hear both sides, they hear all the arguments, but at the end of the day, they issue a decision, and they can't just say what the decision is, yes or no, they have to write a written opinion that explains how they got to that decision. I would love to see the, BR, the BRA have that same requirement, because I think a lot of the frustration is that you go to these meetings, they go really late until, you know, late at night, the decision comes out 9 o'clock the next morning, and you're not quite sure if any of that the night before counted at all. So if they just were required to issue a short written opinion explaining what factors were taken into account, I think that would get at a lot of the um, community input being actually meaningful. Martin Keel? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. My name is Martin Keel. And nice Keel. For the Boston City Council, I have a few extra seconds. <laughs> I, I talk very fast, so I'll probably be really brief. A five minute presentation fee will probably in the past minutes. But anyway, I'm a candidate for the uh, Boston City Council at large. And in my race, you get four votes. I start my presentation the same way I ended. I'm asking each and every one of you to be four votes. I would love to have your uh, endorsement. I'd love to have your support. But I'd more than anything love to have one of your four votes. Uh, the reason why I'm running is that I want safer neighborhoods and I want better schools. Uh, and what do I mean by safe neighborhoods? We read the uh, headlines the last couple of weeks. Uh, there were four gang-related shootings in the last week in Dorchester. There were a couple of murders the week before that. There's been all kinds of things going on in Boston. Now, it's not the Boston police's fault that these things are happening. They're doing a great job. But the problem is we don't have enough police in the streets or we don't have the police in the right place. Um, I've been to a bunch of meetings in this hall already. I've been here in the past as well. And what I hear from people is that we need more police downtown, we need uh, cameras in certain areas of the city, and we need the, the funds to get the resources for the police to better fight crime. Um, without, one of the two of the reasons that people move to the city are they come here because they want safe neighborhoods and they want neighborhood schools. Without either one of them, they're going to take off, and that's what's happening right now, and I'm hearing it across the city. The second part of, uh, of uh, why I'm running is that. Uh, Schools. I want better schools. I want better schools in every single neighborhood. I don't want a neighborhood to have a school that's inadequate where they have to send their kid across town to go to a school that's better. I want them to have a great, excellent, better neighborhood school in their neighborhood. I don't want them sending their kids across town on a bus. We shouldn't be doing that. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of kids' time. I am a Boston Public School uh, student, but I'm also a high school dropout. Uh, what people also don't know, I, uh, let me step back a second. I'm an attorney, but what people don't know is that I dropped out of high school. And uh, I went to law school with this guy right now. <coughs> uh, for the last 12 years, I have uh, represented two miles, people who don't have any money, elderly people who've been scammed by contractors. I helped that, uh, when, uh, people from losing their houses when banks try to foreclose them. I'm very proud of that work, but what I did prior to being an attorney was I did work at the city council and I worked at two different city councils. Um, that's where a lot of you probably remember from over 10 years ago when I used to come to these meetings all the time. Um, my time at the city council was great. I enjoy doing things. I enjoy helping people. I enjoy if somebody calls up and says they need to get a pothole fixed. As a matter of fact, one time uh, the, the uh, public works department we couldn't fill a pothole equipment. I went to the Home Depot and I got a bag of cement and I got that uh, tile stuff and put it in myself. I never heard from that guy again, but I knew he was happy. Um, but I know the issues I know for the meetings I've been coming in. It's trash, it's code enforcement, it's road control, it's parking, and you know, the big one, the ERA uh, issue that's going to be a question that's going to have to answer, I have no problem answering it, is that they're going to put a tower over the uh, government center garage, but there's no plans for where um, people are going to park their cars. Um, the ERA was a necessary, and probably still is a necessary uh, department we have to have because the city has been transformed by the ERA. Some of these projects that the BR are doing, there's no transparency. We can read what's been going on in the paper lately, too, where it seems like one developer is getting bigger over another, etc. There's got to be transparency in the BRA. There's got to be a planning department in the BRA or a separate planning department. But in any way, there's got to be some discussion on what the BRA is doing because it is affecting the city of Boston and it's affecting the people in this neighborhood, in the Back Bay, in Chinatown. So uh, I'm going to end my um, speech the way I started. I'm going to ask you to please consider giving me one of your four votes. 
I would certainly love to have your endorsement, and I'd certainly love to have your support, but I'm asking you please to give me one of your four votes. You will not regret it, and I promise I will earn it. I will work just as hard if you elect me as I am working out to get active. Okay, well, what the problem we have with the uh, Boston Public Schools are that uh, charter schools are a result of uh, the, the um, concerns that parents have had. They think that the Boston Public Schools aren't doing enough to serve kids, so they want to create charter schools to, uh, to um, give kids a better education. I don't think that that's a bad idea. Uh, as far as the uh, creating more charter schools, I'm not in favor because what the charter schools are doing is that they're taking the money and the resources from the Boston Public School Department budget and they're taking the kids uh, that they want in those schools. They're sending back the special ed kids, and sending, uh, sending back the, uh, the kids that uh, don't fit in that child school. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to see the money in the Boston Public School budget go to the Boston Public Schools. The arts, uh, for, you know, obviously for books, I mean, let me start with that first. Obviously for the education, the teachers are doing a great job. We do need more books, we do need more supplies. But I'd like to see arts, I'd like to see music, and I'd like to see sports because that's what I had uh, when I was in Boston Public Schools. The only way we're going to do that is if we really attack that budget and look for where the money is being misspent and we direct it into a place where it should be spent. Uh, if I get on the council, I certainly will have as many uh, hearings on it as possible. I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> um, kind of what my, my question was a little further that there have been schools that have had money through resources thrown at them and we're still not seeing the improvement in the quality of schools which is leading to this cross busing and people moving out of their neighborhoods to go to school um, and so I'm looking besides financial resources and how okay and, and it's just uh, obviously a uh, problem that cannot be solved overnight and again with the, uh, the next mayor is going to hold all the cows that I would think that if I could get in tomorrow, I would do everything I could to make it happen overnight. It's, there's no way that they can fix it overnight. It is a process that's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of discussion. And it's really, you know, I'm just a guy that's running for office. It's what the people want to do. I'm going to do what they tell me to do to, uh, to uh, you know, solve what the problem is. So I, I need your help as we're going to do this even a slight issue. Um, <laughs> the fact that the Zarrison has changed their hours, so we cannot be here past 8 o'clock, which we thought was supposed to be 9 o'clock uh, when we booked the room. Um, so we might have to continue this outside before we can come to the stay you work for should be resources for communities. Hold on one second. So, we're going to go to Doug. Doug Wan. We're good. We're all set. Okay, we're sitting down. All right, all right. Okay, you can have it off. I'm not a bit of a in case my stuff is running on my time. So, and all I want to do tonight is how to know my last name spelling. So I brought my spelling. Here. So my name is one. Do you mean everyone? One. 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 for everyone. Okay. Um, I'm an architect and, and uh, standing on E platform. E as healthier economy for everyone. He has better education for everyone. And I do have a peculiar experience for raising my witness. 
the E as a better eco environment and as an active and very constant for energy efficiency, and E as healthier equality for everyone. And ultimately, the, the ultimate view would be the healthier and better Earth for all of us, everyone. And I came to Boston in 1978. I'm in Boston, living and working for almost 35 years. And when I came to MIT for graduate school, architecture and urban studies, um, I, we went out, we, we sort of all started to run out to all the neighborhoods in Boston. And I was somewhere here in North End, in Summer Square. I don't still know that name. And um, I knew their street, I was friends with me, and I was initially in Columbia Point at the time, it was all loaded up, no one was there, and I couldn't uh, understand it. It was, how could it be that all those huge high rise buildings and solid structures were all loaded up, no one I had to see. So that was uh, beyond any understanding or any imagination. But now it is a, a beautifully diverse uh, mixed uh, neighborhood of Columbia Harbor Point. And we obviously went to uh, restaurant areas in Chinatown and in here. And I've been working in plant and going division as we said um, almost <coughs> close to 30 years. Um, and so I work all, with all kinds of urban fabric, urban tissues, with all so many people, homeowners, homeowners, uh, homeowners, property, owners, property owners, and big projects as well. Um, so I do have some the visions of the city why <coughs> Obviously, East Boston should should decide its destiny, it's coming, whether it's coming or not, whether it's coming. And Mission uh, Hill could be. Mission <laughs> Hill could should be like a beacon hill, like uh, with, uh, with its uh, eminent institutes, like a, a, a long medical area. And Roxbury, uh, it's, it's going to have a completed uh, new municipal center. And it, it can be, it should be a, a, a hub of transportation and hub of economic activity for all Boston, for everyone. And in South Boston, it will, will, will grow with, along with the <coughs> Huge uh, uh, the network the new convention center. And also in Brighton will be improved with its eminent neighbor, uh, Harvard uh, Institute. And Back Bay and South End and North End and the West End of uh, both each other. We've been working on groundwater conservation and which reserves the structure, underground structures, and also reinforcing all these structures are not being reinforced, so it can be very vulnerable for the earthquake comes. It will eventually come, we just don't know when. And so we also, uh, also as an actor, I wanted to emphasize, we're going to go into a new age of sustainability as I have my e platforms. So we have a green roof, uh, urban agriculture, and roof decks, and uh, so. And now, lastly, I just want to share, uh, I've been on Metro parents and Metropolitan Council of uh, Education Opportunities and for, as a board member for more than a dozen years. I do have a peculiar experience of why I don't, uh, 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 why I couldn't say why, why, why my wife and I can send my kids in public school. So I do have that motivation and, and I met a lot of other people in that community and help you and outside of the market and it's a good concern but but the education, among other new platforms, is the, is the most complicated, challenging issue for me. And I, I believe all the other candidates may roles are saying the same thing. Um, okay, my name is Juan, W-O-H-N. <laughs> Just remember my name, that's all I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one for one, Boston. One for the other. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> 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 BRA was born in, I think, a half a century ago in the age of urban renewal, as we know. But it's been changed, and the, the, the time is changing, and it's getting probably getting more powerful, having the two are powerful arms. Perhaps just simply, not a drastical change, but simply just two, two separate directors uh, in presidential medical. And as for your, I met so many people uh, in frustration, homeowners, and small people, about mom and pop, and they signed the lease and come to 1010. And they had to stop up there. And that's just a, 
everyday experience. And we have a new commission on a new electronic spray coming in. So plans are people don't have to come as often they do. And they can send us clicking and we'll click that and email. We'll have a more electronic software coming in process and that will help Thank you. And thank you everyone uh, for your uh, diligence and patience and with 19 folks running obviously it's uh, it, you can imagine that we're also going to, all the candidates are going to be doing this uh, around the city as well um, and it is actually a great experience to to learn so much about each of the candidates because it's, uh, you know they, they are so diverse um, but this is my opportunity to tell you a little bit about me. Uh, the first thing actually I'd like to say is I want to thank all of you, um, uh, 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 especially uh, the folks on behalf of the Democratic uh, Party and uh, the Democratic Committee. Um, I'm also a member and treasurer of the Ward 10 Democratic Committee and a former member of the Ward 7 Democratic Committee when I lived in South Boston. And so I know and understand the work that you do. And um, I was fortunate uh, in 2008 to work on the Hillary Clinton campaign where I traveled to five states on behalf of Hillary. And because of that effort, I was asked by the Obama campaign to join their team and became a regional field organizer for Barack Obama's um, presidential campaign. And I, my territory is actually everything from Boston to Provincetown. And I'm very proud of that work and all the work that we did together. So thank you for that. Um, tell you a little bit more, more about myself. I uh, moved to Boston in 1993. I'm the son of public school teachers. Uh, my father's actually here with me today. I appreciate it. He, he came down from J. Uh, Rosendale. So. <laughs> and my sister's just all the way from Florida, and, ne and nephew somewhere back there. I heard. Um, and so, uh, being the son of public school teachers, you never got away with out doing your homework. And that was a lesson that um, came, uh, especially when my dad was my guidance counselor at one point. And you never want to get sent to the uh, principal's office. And so that um, you know, helped me to become a better student, a better person. I graduated from uh, public schools, went to Stonehill College, earned a degree in political science, was class president and a member of the student senate there. And uh, after college, I struggled to find a job, like many kids today. And I worked, I bartended at night, and I worked at a warehouse during the day. I eventually became the manager of that warehouse, but that's not what I wanted to do. So everywhere in between, I was working on campaigns. I worked on campaigns all over the South Shore. I went to Florida and worked for John Kerry for three months in his presidential campaign. Um, and all of those experiences ended up landing a job at the State House, where I worked for four and a half years um, in the State Senate. And uh, there I, I learned how to write legislation, how to understand budgets, how to you know, lobby for what you need for your district. But I found that that work wasn't really my passion. It was really working closer to the community. And so uh, chance meeting, got me in front of Mayor Benito and, and a job of a lifetime, which was to work in his administration for the last six and a half years. Um, one of my greatest achievements there is working on the census, and uh, uh, Pres Council President Murphy uh, alluded to it, uh, uh, as far as the population, I was actually the director of the census in 2010. And because of our effort, we ended up with the highest population in 30 years, which translates to more federal funding coming back to our city. I'm very proud of that work. I also worked on the Circle of Promise Initiative the last three years, which aligns resources around our turnaround schools. Local resources directly connected to the school. So, for example, um, in the case of the Orchard Garden School, they needed 60 winter coats. We went across the street to the Goodwill and said, hey, you have some coats over there? They never had a conversation with the Goodwill that's directly across the street. And so the Goodwill said, sure, what size do you need? Right? That didn't cost one penny of the taxpayer. It's just collaboration, it's communication. Right? And so I want to take all those experiences and be an advocate for everyone in every part of this city. I want to be an advocate for education. Like I said, son of public school uh, teachers, I understand what it takes, what public school parents uh, uh, have to go through and what teachers have to sacrifice. I remember going to BJ's and half that cart was for the kids. So I know what it's like to grow up in a kind of home where you have to sacrifice. And part of what I'm trying to do in, in, with my life is a little bit of sacrifice because I know it goes a long way for everybody. Uh, I'd also like to address the issues around public safety and services within uh, the community uh, and I would uh, appreciate your support on September 24th and your endorsement tonight. Thank you very much. And I, I want to make sure that I understand it right because I feel like some of the answers aren't exactly addressing. So from a master plan to a neighborhood, neighborhood centric but yet you haven't seen the neighborhood pieces. 
Because I, 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 I feel though, like sometimes I, the answer hasn't been addressing what you're asking. I, well, I've been going to the government center project meetings. Yeah. In fact, there's one tonight. But I came here instead to raise this issue because we have the government center project and this is a project that will go into one of the parcels at the end of the greenway and potentially over at uh, the garden and, right. I, and the Lovejoy Board. This is going to add a lot more population to this area that will be coming into our neighborhood, especially the government center. I think our neighborhood has one of the smallest ratios of park space per resident in the city. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact ratio, but I know that we don't have I know it's a pain to find it, yeah. That's one example. We have all of two tennis courts that is shared with uh, some of the people over in the Strata building from the West End. We have trouble getting the DRA to plan in the sense of looking at the cumulative impact of these projects on the community. What about the public transportation infrastructure? Right. We don't have a grocery store. We've been waiting 15 years since before I lived here for a grocery store. We still don't know when we're going to have something other than Whole Foods. The BRA seems to insist on reviewing every project on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. I don't think so it works. So, so, okay, now I feel like I understand your question. So I think part of the problem is that things operate in silos in city government. And I can say that because I've been working the last seven years. They operate in silos, and um, too often there isn't enough conversations happening. So um, one of the things you mentioned as far as the trains and this and that, um, there's the Complete Streets projects, uh, project. Have you, the, so Complete Streets is a, is a uh, function of, of, it's a partnership between BRA and DND where they've literally mapped out every single train track, the ones that are active and not active, every lamp post and, you know, uh, everywhere and the potential of where the new ones can be. But that is a project that lives in its own atmosphere. It's not actually applied directly to the grassroots. It's not taken out on the street and vetted with the community. And so as a city council, I'd like to put their feet to the fire to make sure that we get out there, present all these great ideas that we have in some uh, single, sing, single unified manner that is intelligible for every one of the communities. And I also want to just um, follow up with uh, what Michelle and what Jeff said, which is that it needs to be community driven. Because if, it, if you're going to wait on the government to do it, you'll be dead before it happens, right? So it needs to be community driven. So your passion for the issue is, uh, is obvious, but you need to make sure that, we, that we're rallying around that cause. And as a city councilor, I would be happy to advocate on your behalf, hold hearings, and do whatever I have to do to make that a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your get it done um, approach. Um, is there a is there a single system wide change that you would make that you think would immediately benefit our public school kids? Start, start over. Uh, uh, well, the the uh, and I don't, and I don't mean that as far as um, I think what's happening in the classroom is 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 there's excellent work happening in every classroom. I think there's some great principles out there. I think that overall there's there's a, a lot of great things happening. As far as one single change. Yeah. No. I, I will. And, and no. I, and I think it's I think it's parent parental involvement. I think that we, we need to do a much better job of that system-wide, right? There are not enough parents engaged in the process. Yes, we have parent university. Yes, we have uh, su uh, the sustainability programs. Yes, we have all these excellent things that are, but they're all one-ups. There's no actual parent engagement that is real in every single um, school that is, um, you know, and it, and it has to look different because parent engagement in Eastie is going to look a lot different than parent engagement in Roxbury, right? But it happens in both places, but it's not consistent. So if, if there were one thing I would say it's parental involvement. Anyone else? Thanks. Well, thank you. Because I feel that my voice as a mother, as a Boston school teacher, and as a small business owner isn't heard at City, at city Hall and at the City Council. And I'm, I'm one of those types of people that feels that when you've got an issue and you want to offer to fix it, or you want to get it fixed, you, you sort of step up and, and do it. Um, I'm going to start with first my family. My husband and I have four children. I have an eight-year-old boy and a seven-year-old triplets, um, which gives me a, a very good perspective on life and raising a family in the city. My husband and I both were brought up and raised in Dorchester. We live behind my in-laws. I'm about five streets away from my parents. 
um, went to uh, Boston Tech for high school, graduated, went to Boston University by way of Beverly College, graduated with a degree in political science. I've always been very interested in politics. Um, but along the way, I worked for a company called, or an organization called Boston Private Industry Council, and I went to work at East Boston High. And I fell in love with teaching. I became a teacher at East Boston High. Uh, well, back to school, got my master's, did all the things I need to do, and I've been teaching there now for 12 years. And I think that with all of, or I know, that with all of the conversations happening over the last few years around schools and education, having a Boston public school teacher at the table was a, is a really important asset to have. And, and that, like I said, is one of the reasons I'm running. We've talked so much about schools in the last year, but we've talked about assignment, and we've talked about getting kids into schools. But we haven't talked about the overall quality of our schools. We have sort of using the word quality, but we haven't developed a measurement for what quality is. And we have not talked at all about high school. It's almost as if we'll get our kids into our good neighborhood schools, uh, wherever those might be, and we'll pray to God that they get to Latin School or Latin Academy. I didn't go to either one of those. Um, and if they don't get in, well, at least we got those first couple of years done. Now we'll suck it up and pay it for private school. Um, and I think that all of the high schools should really be the way they were decades ago. Unfortunately, it's been decades ago. Our neighborhood high schools used to be okay to go to. We were very proud when we graduated from, whether it was Charlestown High or Selby High or East Boston High. And I, I think that that's something that needs to be discussed again is the quality of our high schools. And, and that's one way to keep people here for the duration um, of raising their families and sending their kids off to college and beyond. And one of the ways that I think that we'll do that and secure that for our schools is to bring in partners into the schools. We need um, workforce development for our kids. You've heard that all along. And I think one of the ways to do that is to connect each high school in the city of Boston with a union, each high school in the city of Boston with a private company, and each high school in the city with a university or college. And bringing those adults and mentors into the building, letting the teachers do the teaching piece. Because if you let teachers go in the classroom, they can teach. It's those wraparound services, it's those adult relationships, it's those mentoring opportunities that we lose. Um, I heard the alarm, so I could pick something nice. I know. It's um, <laughs> most important to me, though, above all else, because I really feel that it, it really dictates all else, is public safety. If we're not safe in our homes, we're not safe in our community, we're not safe in our schools or our businesses. I own a small business in Dorchester called Stitch House. It's a yarn shop with teach knitting and sewing. Um, I ran out of yarn tonight during this meeting. <laughs> yeah. But I've had my... Um, I've had my shop windows blown out a number of times, and it's a it's a terrible, terrible thing to happen. Certainly not the worst thing to happen, because I'm a resident of the community where my business is. I saw those broken windows every time they happened, and it made me crazy. So as a responsible business owner, that glass got repaired at my expense, but it's something I you know I did when I went into business. But that public safety piece, if we're not safe in all aspects of our lives, we're not going to stay. My husband and I grew up in the city, so our deep our roots are very deep. But crime, small and big, really wear out the core of our city. And that's a big deal. Found a guy in my house a number of years ago, chased him, caught him. Um, born and bred in Dorchester, like I said, he went to jail. But he's back on the streets committing more crimes. And I think it's a real big issue for our, our city. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I think that testing is a part of it. It's a very small piece, but it is one way to compare school against school if we talk about the MCAS. I think that we should also talk about the SAT scores because that's a slightly different type of test. One way to measure um, achievement. Reading levels are a really big way to measure achievement because if we're socially promoting kids without the ability to read or uh, without the ability to do any sort of complex or you know, better math than they've been doing, they're not going to be successful over time. So those standardized tests do provide that sort of measurement. But I think that we do community satisfaction surveys within each of our school communities. And that school community is not just the student, the parent, or the caregiver, but it's the teachers, it's the administrations, and it's the community at large. It's the businesses in the community, it's their connection to those schools. And by assessing that, you really do see the impact that a school has. A lot of people would say that East Boston High isn't that great of a school if you look at just our test scores because we have a huge um, language learner population. 
and we expect kids to come to this country and pass the test within a year, it's not, it's not fair to anyone. It's not fair to the teachers, it's not fair to the kids and families, it's not fair to the community at large. But what we do have, and we talk about it, you know, the blue and gold, you know, class pride and tradition, but our school is very connected to the community. When our athletics do well, the businesses come out and support us. We have well over a million dollars in family and community scholarships every year. And that's, that's something that needs to be measured and never is. And um, I think that's part of that quality. And that can be done across all grade levels. I know high school, that's where I've been, that's my background. Um, but that's one of those measurements. And the other piece is how long kids are staying in that school. Because a parent will pull a child if they're not happy with that school. So I think that that's a tool that needs to be measured. Or that's a, that's a piece of data that needs to be measured. The BRA, I mean, it's a lot of what we've heard tonight. It's that separating that piece. I'm, I, I'm a former Civic Association president. I've been very active in my community. I've participated on task forces. I've um, also been um, not allowed to be on a task force because I voiced my belief that they don't really count. We can participate, we go to meetings over and over again, but in the end, the BRA really does do what it wants to do, and I think that, that community, um, the community rate needs to be much stronger than it is. It really is sort of a crapshoot what happens. In, uh, well, in a, lot of, a lot of candidates are looking for a master plan for the entire city. I think that that's a good place to start, but we as a city need to be able, be able to hold the BRA responsible for what they're doing or not doing, as the case may be. Thank you. Yeah. And for you, Troop, for sticking out this, this long meeting. Um, I'm running for city council. My name is Gareth Saunders. I'm running for city council because I want Boston to be a more livable city for our seniors, for our veterans, for people who are poor, working class people, and middle class, and wealthy people who live in our city. Um, as some of you may know, I'm a former Boston City Councilor. I was elected, first elected in 1993 when Mayor Menino was elected, and I served three terms. I left the council in 1999. A little bit about my background, how I got involved with politics. Like many of you in this room, I started out being a part of a neighborhood association. I joined the Roxbury, I, I was uh, from Roxbury, I joined the Roxbury Neighborhood Council, got involved with the planning. And back in the early uh, 90s, Roxbury and Dorchester had 70% of the vacant land in the city of Boston. So we were really involved with the new zoning and the planning for development. So that's one of the reasons how I got involved in politics. Now, I left politics, let me say this, I believe in term limits. I'm a firm believer in term limits. I left politics in 1999 to pursue some of my other passions, which were business, um, my faith, and um, um, doing some travel, did some world travel. Um, I got back, I'm getting back involved in politics because as a citizen and a neighbor, um, I watched and I didn't like the direction our city was going in. You know, some of the things that we were working in in the 90s, and I thought we were in, heading in the right direction, we kind of fallen to the wayside. For example, public safety. Um, let, me, let me just say this. We, we know the solutions. We know the solutions. With public safety, we have to deal with prevention, enforcement, and what I would call rehabilitation for people who have been traumatized by crime. Okay? Prevention. Let's get to the young people. We know when we have uneducated young people in our city, the crime goes up. And then you have to connect the public safety issues with the public school system. So we have to provide quality education, as you heard from a lot of the other candidates tonight, for all of our students and all of our neighborhoods. Now, when we talk about, I know I heard a few people talk about the assignment plan that was passed recently by the school group. Okay, having uh, local neighborhood schools are very convenient for parents. And intrinsically, they're fine. The problem with that is if you don't have good, well, high performing schools in all of the neighborhoods, you punish people who live in neighborhoods that don't have those types of schools. If I had it my way, I think, I think they put the cart before the horse, and I would have made sure that we had a plan to bring all the schools up to speed first, or at least had a plan and work the plan. I hear the, I hear the buzzer. I would, I, would love, I would love your support. I would love your vote. 
um, uh, in this upcoming election, one of your four votes for at-large city councilor. And one thing I can say about me, I'm a person that's not afraid to speak truth to power. And then one of, one of the issues really is, and I think one of the most important things that we can do this year, this is a very important year, is to elect a new mayor and some new city council members. But when you talk about the BRA, I listen to all the answers. My experience with dealing with planning from the neighborhood level and also as a city councilor, the most important part about the BRA is who's in the mayor seat. Who's in the mayor seat? Because if you look at it, the mayor really controls what the BRA does. And I can tell you this from my experiences, the BRA would not approve any project without the okay of the sitting mayor. That is, that is really the problem. So I understand people hear about, well, we need to divide development from planning, and that could work. But the real problem, you can have a divided development um, part and a <coughs> planning part, but you're still going to have a mayor that's controlling both. So in my experience, I think the bigger problem is making sure that we elect a new mayor that's sensitive to community participation and would honor and hold the community wishes as an equal partnership with the developers. And that's what I really feel about that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are warriors. Thank you for staying here until the end. My name is Catherine O'Neill. What an exciting time it is to be in the city of Boston. What an exciting time it is to run for Boston City Council at large. If you want, you can elect four lawyers and send them to the Boston City Council at large. If you want, you can elect two restaurant owners and send them to the Boston City Council at large. But if you want, you can rock the house and send four women to the Boston City Council at large for the first time in history. <laughs> Choices. Choices. That's why my parents came to this country with their six sons because we get choices here. And you have plenty of them. And I asked you to pick me for one of your choices. I grew up in Dorchester. My parents had three more children in Dorchester, my sisters and I. They saved the best for last. My niece Mary and her husband Gray have called the North End home for how many years, Mary? Ten. Ten years. So even though I'm out of my neighborhood, I feel a little bit at home tonight. Thank you very much. And she's going to report to her grandmother how I did. So. Uh, my 93-year-old mother is my biggest supporter. When I first started this journey, people said to me, when I got qualified, it was a very, very late entry. When I got qualified, people said to me, you better pick issues. You better pick issues. You need three issues. And I said to all my very smart friends, why do I need to pick issues? I'm not running for Boston City Council at large so I can tell you what my issues are. I'm running for Boston City Council at large so I can hear what your issues are. BRA? I worked for Michael Flaherty from 2005, not in the City Council office, but I campaigned for him. And one of the reasons I campaign for him is because I agree with a lot of things that he says. And I agree with everything that Michael Flaherty said about the BRA. We need to separate it. We need to plan our work and work our plan. Dorchester Avenue, the straightest, longest road in the city of Boston, one of them. It should be the mainest main street in the city of Boston, the longest. Let's plan that. <laughs> but thank you very much. I would appreciate your thoughts and your endorsement process. And, um, you know, one other thing. On Dorchester Avenue, 20 years ago you couldn't get a cappuccino or sushi. I know you could always get sushi and cappuccino in the North End. 
But now we can get that on Dorchester Avenue. So I know how to work with people, people that know what to do, and I will bring that experience to the Boston City. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I just want to be very brief. I know people want to go, and I've had the pleasure, like a lot of, unfortunately, some people that have come before me, of hearing some of the concerns and questions, and I get to sit back and sort of articulate what I didn't like as a response, and then I said, okay, now I'm going to answer it this way. So, um, just a brief bio with myself. I grew up in Charleston, right across the bridge, so I used to come over here all the time as a young kid, and so I'm very familiar with the North End, I'm familiar with a lot of people that grew up here, and I'm familiar with the culture and the changing culture that, that Boston, the North End, and the South End, and every neighborhood in Boston has experienced as a changeover because growing up in Charlestown, in my opinion, it is a microcosm of everything that's happened throughout the city. Gentrification, old school Boston, and then some of the other issues with immigration and economically depressed people all live in Charlestown. So I've dealt with that in my past role as neighborhood liaison for the mayor of Boston. So I know exactly how to work with very diverse communities and get them on one path to work towards one common good. So a couple quick things, I'm just going to get right to it. I was I graduated from Matinon High School. I graduated. I have a degree from UMass Boston. But the degree that I got from UMass Boston actually happened recently. And the reason it happened recently, because in my personal life, I was addicted to Oxycontin and eventually became a heroin addict. I say that because it's very important. I want people to hear that. I want people to see the difference in the transparency that I bring as a candidate. I want to, there's a specific thing that you talked about schools, and the reason I bring the substance abuse issue up, we talk about fixing schools. What are we going to do to fix schools? I'm going to tell you right now, we can't fix schools unless we fix neighborhoods. We can't. We absolutely can't. Economically depressed neighborhoods in our city will never, ever agree to neighborhood schools if their neighborhoods continue to be corrupt, continue to be led by, led by you know, influences that are negative and cause social problems that will completely decimate not only a school system but a city. We've seen since the Boston Marathon, what is it now, 79, 80 shootings? So, how are we going to go into, how am I going to go into as a city councilman and talk about neighborhood schools and lifting the charter cap and doing all this stuff that was very beneficial to my neighborhood of Charlestown and the Warren Prescott. I've seen them great things there, right? But that's because there was good parents. There was a good functioning neighborhood. Of course the school got better. But how are we going to do the same exact thing in certain neighborhoods that don't have that? That have parents that are addicted to drugs, that have gang violence. How are those children, those, those people, that's not just us, that's not just happening in a vacuum. Those are real kids, real people that live in those neighborhoods that then have to go to Boston Public School. If we don't fix the social causes that affect some of the problems that the reason schools are in the form, we're never going to fix this problem. We will be here 30 years. Hopefully not one of my kids is doing this, but we will be. We will be here doing the same exact thing just like they did 35 years ago. It's the same issue. It hasn't changed. It's the same exact problem. So we have to fix the neighborhoods. We have to get healthier neighborhoods. And we have to get... There we go. <laughs> so I'm a big proponent of trying to fix neighborhoods, trying to uplift people, trying to use the government, use community, use resources, and get people getting on the same path that we can uplift each other. Because the only way we do that is through caring and making sure that there are good programs for children at a preventative age, but also fixing the people that are still causing problems in our neighborhood. There's a lot of ways we can do it. I can't get into it now. But I do want to talk about what you said about you know, the VRA and how do we make the process better. I have an iPhone. Most people right now do, right? Most people who are trying to get a, a restaurant permit most likely have a smartphone. There is no reason when you're trying to go to a vacation spot and you use Orbit or you use one of these other things, you can get on your phone and it is a step-by-step -step process of in common language of how to do it. If you want to rent a car, if you want to go have a martini, if you want to have a, a drink special, whatever it is, they have from your flight to your rental car to your pickup to your hotel, all the way until you come back to Boston, a step-by-step -step process that you can pay for things or decline them all through the way. And I want to do that through phones, through smart technology. That's how we use innovation to practically get people's lives better. And so how we fix that problem, when you, if, you're, if you're a restaurant owner and you want to open something in the South End and you want to do something in Charleston, if you want to do something in West Roxbury, there will be an application through ISD that says, very specifically, I want to open a restaurant. And you click it. And then the, then the fire department will kick in. And then you do that. And then there's all, all the stuff that happens along the way that you, when you go to 1010 Mass Ave will be on your phone. And these are the types of solutions that I'm going to push for when I'm a city councilor. So I'm going to open it up for questions now because it's, everybody's tired. So. <laughs> Nothing else? BRA. So the BRA. I was the neighborhood liaison in Charlestown. And I 
had to deal with the BRA issues all the time. Charlestown is very similar to South End and very similar to North End. We have no parking, right? We have overdevelopment. We have a lot of people that are upset with the development that feel the development negatively impacts them and their quality of life at the expense of the greater good of the city. So what I always, my job was to always tell people, and sometimes almost like people, well, this is good for the whole overall city. Well, people don't care. If your life is impacted, why do you care if it's good for the overall city? I think philosophically we all do, but on a personal level, why should you have to bear that burden, right? So we need transparency through the development process. The BRA, just like Garrett talked about, unfortunately, the mayor does control that. I'd like to tell you what I would do to change the BRA. There's a city council, I can't do that. I can, I can use my bully pulpit, but one of the things concretely that I can do, and I will push for, is I want a ceremonial vote to keep people that are appointed within the BRA. A ceremonial vote so we can ask these questions about how they're going to lead. And we can go on record as city councilors whether we vote for them or vote against them. So that's one thing that I will push for to make sure that any person that the mayor is going to appoint in the BRA to any important, whether it's development or, or um, I mean, development or economic activity, that they have to come through us and they get a ceremonial vote. So that's something that I'm going to push for. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. I just want to go the cross. We're going to call District 1 first, District 2, and then that line. You're going to do a roll call vote by the Secretary. When the name is announced, you will uh, we'll announce District, we'll do district 1 first. Actually, when the name is announced, we're going to announce District 1, 2, and then Lodge. You have to vote for one candidate in the District 1 race. And those candidates are La Latina, Gannon, not related to Virginia. Thank you. <laughs> and Rivero Jr. In the District 2 race, one candidate you will choose. And that is between Lee and Linnigan. In the at large race, you will vote up to four candidates. In every race, you may vote present. So you'd have to say a name or present. You have to give an answer of one of those. Um, and as you can see, all the names uh, at large again. Do I have to repeat them? Um, anyway, so it's a two thirds threshold for endorsement. So we'll, the, the clerk will tally the votes. Um, anyone have any questions on the water committee about the voting process? Pardon? Can we have KPMG Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, what's your call the roll? Cindy Asbury, District 1. Uh, Sal on the uh, District 2. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, we're going, we're going through the whole thing? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, at large. Uh, Jack Halley, Michelle Wu, uh, Ayana, and uh, Steve Burton. Sorry. Napamonte. Present. <laughs> District <laughs> 1. Sal Martina. District 2. Present. At large. Stephen Murphy, Ayanna Presley, Ramon Soto, and Michelle Wolf. Chris Becky, District 1. Um, Sal Valentina. Uh, District 2. Present. At large, Murphy, Presley, Wu, Larry. Catherine Burton, District 1. Um, Sal Valentina. District 2. Present. At large. Uh, Stephen Murphy, Ayanna Presley, uh, Ramon Soto, and Michelle Wu. Kathy, uh, District 1. Valentina. District 2. Bill Inhan. 
Jack Kelly, Steve Murphy, Ron President. Sorry, did you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Who did you want to do that? That line, sorry. Sorry. Jack Kelly, mm -hmm. Steve Murphy, Ron President. Uh, Stephen Chan, uh, District 1, Lama well, Sino. District 2, Suzanne Lee. At large. Uh, Ayanna Presley, Steve Murphy, Ramon Soto, and Michelle Lewis. Marianne. Um, Marianne. District 1, Ron Latina. District 2. Flaherty. Uh, no, no, District 2. I'm sorry. Minahan. Uh, at large. Flaherty. Oh. Presley and Kevin. Mike Falcone, District 1. Present. Uh, District 2. Lee. Matt Marge. Ayanna Presley, Jeff Ross, Michelle Lou. Present. Uh, William Furulo, District 1. Love it, Tina. District 1. Sousa, not then, Bill Fredroli. We got this in the state says. Steve Burke, Ayanna Presley, Michelle Wood. But that doesn't count though, right? Connor Finley, District 1. Sal Lama, Tina. District 2. Uh, present. At large, um, Michelle Wu, Stephen Murphy, I am present. Francine Gannon, District 1. Sal Martino. Mm -hmm. uh, District 2. Bill Linehan. Uh, at large, um, Stephen Murphy, Michelle Wu, Ariana Presley, and Michael Flower. James Gannon, District 1. Sal Lamartina, District 2. Bill Lenahan, at large. Michelle Wu, Ayanna Presley, Steve Murphy, Michael Flaherty. Michael Giswaldi, District 1. Salvatore Latina, District 2. Present, at large. Uh, Steve Murphy, Ayanna Presley, Michelle Wu, and Jack Kelly. Mark Heimovitz, District 1. Sala Martina. District 2. Present. At large. Steve Murphy, Diana Presley, Ramon Soto, and Michelle Wu. Rebecca Kaiser, District 1. Uh, Sala Martina. Uh, District 2. Susan Lee. At large. Steve Murphy, Diana Presley, and Michelle Wu. Nicole Leo, District 1. Sal District 2. Present. At large. Uh, Steve Murphy, Ayanna Presley, Jack Kelly, and Ramon Soto. Jerry Moretti, District 1. Sal Lamartina, District 2. Linehan. At large. Steve Murphy, Michelle Wu. Ayanna Presley and Phil Frateroli. Stephen Pascantelli, District 1. South Carolina, District 2. Bill in here. Uh, at large. Michelle Wu, Ayanna Presley, Stephen Murphy, Jack Kelly. Maria Popolo, District 1. Lamartina. District 2. Present. At large. Um, Steve Murphy, Anna Presley, Michelle Wu. Daniel Toscano, District 1. La Martina. District 2. Bill Linehan. Uh, at large. Jack Kelly, Steve Murphy, Diana Presley, Michelle Wu. Blake Weber, I vote for Salentino for District 1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
present on District 2. And then I vote for uh, Steve Murphy, Ayanna Presley, and Michelle Wu. Uh, Jason Aluya, District 1. Not with me. District 2. Present. At large. Michelle Wu, Ayanna Presley, Steve Murphy, and Kelly. Anyone, everyone else, everyone voted, correct? Um, Mr. Alan Mateen has been endorsed by the Water Creek Democratic Committee. District 2, um, 14 needed for endorsement. Lee received four votes. Linehan received eight votes. And there were 10 present. Thus, no endorsement would be issued in the District 2 votes. At large. I'm not going to read the people who got no votes, so I will read. Clarity received four votes. Kelly, eight votes. Murphy, 20 votes. Presley, 22 votes. Ross, one vote. Soto, five votes. And Wu, with 20 votes and two votes of Jonathan Dillon, Phil Federoli. Thus, um, Steve Murphy, Ayanna Presley, and Michelle Wu have received endorsements. Right. Anyone any questions? Congratulations, guys. Thank you.